Seeing none, we're simply going to have public comment until we run out. So if you would all please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, you may also type into the chat, uh, but the raise hand function is preferable. We'll be devoting three minutes per person. And I see the screen filling up quite uh, dramatically. Chair Boland. Yes, Mr. Flaherty. I, I do wonder if, uh, if we should consider a motion for two minutes. Um, I just did a, some quick math, 13 times 15 screen, 15 people per block on my screen times 13 pages. Um, well, times I, I have minutes. 25 people with raised hands so far, 26. Okay. So I don't think it's too bad okay. right now. Okay. Um, I just, just trying to make sure we hear everybody yeah. and give everyone a fair due. Uh, Mr. Lucas, do you want to handle the the honors of calling on people? Yes, and I've been trying to note folks who have had their hands raised at any point during the meeting, so I will uh, try to go in order that um, uh, that you raised your hands, but uh, at some point I may just need to go with who I see on the screen. So I believe Wendy Bernstein uh, is up first, and Wendy should now be able to unmute. Oh, uh, let me let me say before anyone speaks. Um, again, this is a one-way. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, council members, members of the staff, are not going to directly answer questions based on your comments tonight. Um, we will take them under advisement. If a member wishes to use their time after public comment to ask a question that you raise rhetorically, uh, then yeah, they may do so. But uh, we are not going to wait for. Uh, don't wait for us to respond. Simply make your comment and we'll go to the next speaker. With that, Ms. Bernstein, if you would go ahead. Uh, okay. three minutes. Um, having walked around Bryant Park for years, I walked today looking around thinking where could an encampment go that wouldn't uh, intrude on people's feeling that the park was for everybody, but not for anybody permanently. And so, I don't feel good about having a homeless encampment in any of the parks where the public generally goes a lot. And so the irony to me is that Seminary Square Park is very contained and surrounded mostly by commercial or uh, places or streets. But then I read about um, a young woman across the street who's front porch has had people sleeping on it and his, her front yard is covered with needles. So I don't think there's any great place to put a homeless encampment. And I don't think that's a fabulous solution. And there have been moments when I've gone to the post office and felt somewhat concerned about some activities of people in the parking lot from the uh, park. But this problem is unbelievable, and I wish us luck, and I hope we can go slowly on this, just like I hope we can go slowly on the UDO process, which has also felt very fast. Thank you. Thank you. Next commenter. Next up is Jerry Hayes. Mr. Hayes, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I think we can all agree that everyone should have a warm, dry, safe place to sleep each night. Camping outdoors in Bloomington is often not warm or dry, and camping in parks could be unsafe at times. Outdoor camping in Bloomington parks is not the most humane or cost-effective solution for providing shelter for those living outdoors. In the introductory section of the ordinance, it states that in January, 2021 outreach workers at Beacon identified up to 64 individuals sleeping in or near Seminary Park or in camps elsewhere. And I understand that that's not the total unhoused population, that's just those that were camping. So 64 people in a population of 80,000, that's a, a fairly small number. In addition to that, the, the section introductory section also states that persons experiencing homelessness may at times be ineligible or prohibited from certain shelters. It would be interesting to know how many of the 64 people identified by Beacon were ineligible or prohibited from shelters. As was discussed earlier tonight, I think that number would be pretty small. As public funds uh, will be used to implement and sustain the requirements of the ordinance, 
The public's entitled to know what the cost will be to implement the ordinance, the annual cost for sustaining it, and how it will be funded. No action should be taken on Ordinance 2106 until the public has been informed of and has an opportunity to comment on the financial impact of the proposed ordinance and the funding sources that are identified. Once costs are determined, we'll have an opportunity to find the most humane and cost-effective ways to provide shelter to our neighbors living outdoors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Next speaker, please. Up is Dan Combs. Mr. Combs, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Mr. Combs? Is he able to unmute? Okay, now I found him unmute for this. There he is. Um, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Dan Combs. I'm Perry Township trustee. I, as such, I am the overseer of a, a, an administrator of public relief within the township. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, for, and I have a lot of things I want to say. I sent you all a letter today, um, and I hope that I covered the main points in a coherent manner. One of the things I have to keep going back to on this is the, it's, and I appreciate the administration's position, but what I keep hearing is let's slow down on what progress this ordinance proposes in search of perfection. And that troubles me greatly because that's a great way to deflect from the entire issue and put it off and put it off. And the reason I say that is because I went to my first meeting on homelessness in Bloomington in 1988. And this meeting is a little bit different. It's the first one I think that is different, but that to me that's sign that there's progress in those 33 years. Um, one of the things that ties in with that is this presents you all with a very hard policy decision. And that's good. If it was easy, we wouldn't need you. Because of these hard things, that's why you are there. Um, city employees, I've worked with them, county employees, state employees, the easy gets accomplished every day. Now, for one minor correction, I've heard um, city representatives in both townships once, um, and that troubles me, and I've said it publicly. In the five years of this current administration, not one time has a city employee ever asked us what we do and how we do it. When we throw out these good words, collaboration, cooperation, to me, that would imply we all know what each other is doing. So um, I'm feeling a little left out of the process here. And then in uh, the quick summary, in my years of doing what I do, I've, we are primarily in a homeless prevention position. Um, we work very little with actual homeless people anymore. Uh, because there's just nowhere to send people. Uh, there's nowhere that we can rent for them. None of that old stuff applies. But <clears throat> one thing I've learned in all this time is that what I think someone needs may not be what they think they need. And I think that's crucial when we talk about people who refuse to go to shelter. That's so, your time, Mr. Combs. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Aaron Predmore. Ms. Predmore, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you, Councilman Volan, um, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to have this very uh, critical public conversation. Um, I'm Aaron Predmore, the President and CEO of the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, um, and in that role, um, we, the Chamber has already released a statement um, stating our opposition to the ordinance as it is written right now. Um, I don't want to repeat that here tonight, um, as you all will have an opportunity and I'm sure have, have already begun to, to look at all those emails that you've been getting. I do uh, like to encourage everyone, though, to check out the comments um, that we did 
put up on our website with our statement. And the reason I want to do that is I want to give voice to so many of our business um, owners and employees throughout the community that have been dealing with the situation um, as best they could and have had some really negative consequences throughout the last several months. Before you dismiss us as just the business group, um, I do want to remind you that the very people that are in these, this business group are your neighbors and your friends. Um, we're the ones that donate and support the nonprofits in town with uh, silent auction items or opportunities to uh, give away different things that may be needed um, and support and, and supplies that may be needed. And we care a great, de great deal about everyone here in this community. We also employ tens of thousands in our community and we'd like to continue to do that in a positive way. We do want to be part of the solution and we look forward to being um, working with everyone in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. Next commenter, please. Next up is Thomas uh, Westgard. Mr. Westgard, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Mr. Westgard, are you unmuted? Mr. Westgard, let's come back to him. Can we go to the next speaker? Hi, actually, uh, can you hear me? Is. Yeah, go ahead. You'll have three minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you. I probably don't need all that. Um, so the thing I've been noticing about this is that uh, the people opposing the ordinance seem to kind of want to have things both ways. And to me, the most significant thing to notice is that there was apparently the expertise to send the police out, to send an, uh, a team of armed people with guns out to take away ta tents, take away possessions, and throw people out into the night. Now, I know that there was some suggestion that, uh, well, you know, you can go to this shelter. But ultimately, as Chief Dikoff uh, admitted, after being beaten up 12 times, yeah, they were under threat of arrest. Uh, and there was expertise for that. There was budget for that. But now, you know, it's not like this problem came up out of nowhere. The, the homelessness problem has been building for years and Monroe County has the worst affordability for housing in the entire state. And that didn't start yesterday. So all the time, you had all the time in the world to come up with a long-term solution for this and you didn't. But what you did do was you funded the police, you sent them. If you really don't have the expertise, if you really don't have the budget, then don't leave them alone. And if you do have the expertise to send the police, then you have not only the expertise, but the obligation to have a complete answer when you decide to do that. Uh, there were several other things that, yeah, the discretion in enforcement, you know, Dikoff said, okay, well, we don't have to enforce every law. But then there was another speaker also speaking against the ordinance who said, Oh, well, we have an obligation to enforce the law. Well, which is it, you know, because you're really trying to have it both ways there. We're enforcing the law, property law of trespassing, but the Boise case says that we have a civil right to have a place to sleep. So we're not enforcing the civil rights. We're only enforcing the property law. You want to have it both ways. The other is, what are the costs? What are the costs of keeping them in the park? Well, what are the costs of throwing people out into a winter night? You need to answer that before you say that you need to know the costs. And finally, urgency. You say there's uh, an urgency to clear the camp, but there's no urgency to find solutions for when you do that. You can't have it both ways. Pick a team. All right, that's all. Thank you. Next commenter, please. Next up is Vox Booker. Mr. Booker, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hey, Council. Thank you for taking on this tough issue. I appreciate all the diligence that I've seen Matt and Kate and Isabel put into this. Um, I'm your friendly neighborhood human rights commissioner, uh, but before I had that glamorous life, uh, I worked in social services. I managed the emergency homeless shelter for Shalom. Uh, I was a rehabilitation specialist for Centerstone, dealing with co-occurring mental illness, addictions, 
generally folks experiencing homelessness. Uh, and I currently serve on the county's affordable housing commission. Uh, one of the jobs I'm most proud of, though, is that I do uh, public relations for Hotels for Homeless. So that night, Hotels for Homeless, that night being the night of the eviction in December, processed in 17 people from the uh, seminary perk. Uh, the next day, we processed in two more who came from the Stride Center. Uh, in the Stride Center, you can only stay for 23 hours, so they had to go somewhere because they couldn't go to... Uh, Shalom. So we've got to understand that, first of all, we're talking about people. And we, we have to be, we have to understand this is a question of who belongs here. Uh, we say that there can't be tents in Seminary Square and, and rules are rules, uh, even though there's a pandemic, but at the same time, we see tents go up on Kirkwood. Uh, we, we bend the rules for those folks that have money and those folks that are enfranchised. Um, we make space in all public perks for dogs. We can spend 50 million to house vehicles and parking garages. Uh, you've got to understand that criminalizing homelessness is the most expensive and the least effective way to address homelessness. Um, Criminalization measures don't do anything to address the underlying root causes of homelessness. At most, they can just disappear people or displace people. Uh, and there's a lot of barriers that we create for homeless folks. Uh, we talk about substance use addiction. If I want to drink two drinks and go home, I can do that. But if I'm out in public, uh, suddenly it's an issue of am I going to be publicly intoxicated? Uh, you have to worry about where am I going to find a place to sleep that's that's not uh, in uh, private or public property. Uh, the purpose of these camps, of this ordinance, isn't supposed to be permanence. It isn't supposed to be a solution. It's supposed to create a safe space for the moment and spur the community to action, to find meaningful solutions for these problems that we've been addressing since Dan comes with my age. It's time is now. People talk about uh, the cost. The cost is that we had people in our community die, freeze to death in our wealthy community, in the, in the shadow of IU. And what failure looks like is exactly what we have now, and we can and should do better. That's your Thank time. You. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Dave Warren. Mr. Warren, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, so we know that the city has struggled on the issue of housing affordability and homelessness, just like most cities in the U.S. We also know the city's tools are a bit limited on these issues. The state bans us from doing lots of things, but they're not preventing us from passing this ordinance, very similar to Indy's ordinance, to protect our most vulnerable neighbors. They're not preventing the city from ending their decades-long prioritization of the most expensive type of house. They're not preventing the city from making further investments in Housing First programs. They're not preventing the city from changing its budget priorities to focus on basic human necessities rather than luxuries like a city-owned golf course, subsidies for homeowners, housing for cars, and welcome monuments. We hear an awful lot from the city about all of, all of the things we can't do, but too often we see the city's executive and legislative branches passing on things that we can do choosing instead to go along with the status quo demands of relatively comfortable people in our community while kicking the can down the road for others to deal with. A local government that fails to care for its most vulner vulnerable re residents in a pandemic, no less, is a government that must change. I think it's also important to look at how different members of the community are treated by its local government's decision makers. In the past couple of years, we've seen the city refuse to do the following. The city refused to relinquish control of a farmer's market that harbors white nationalist vendors. The city refused to protect those experiencing homelessness from having their encampment cleared, going, going against CDC guidelines, um, guidance on encampments during the pandemic. The mayor refuses to support tonight's ordinance. But look at what happened just a, a week or two ago. After getting calls from homeowners, many likely living in expensive neighborhoods, the mayor walked back his zoning reform proposal prior to a single public hearing. Time and time again, the city errs on the side of satisfying community members with economic and political power over those without. It listens to the wants of the comfortable and denies long overdue needs for the community as a whole. 
That is perhaps no more obvious than in how the city deals with its many housing problems, and it needs to change. Golf course, not a core function of government. Farmer's market, not a core function of government. Those things would exist anyway. Protecting the health, safety, and opportunities for those in our community with the least political and economic power and ensuring equal justice for them under the law, that is absolutely a core function, function of government. Please protect our homeless neighbors with this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next comment, please. Next up is Black Lives B-Town. Would you please state your name for the record? Hi, uh, this is Jada B from Black Lives Matter Bloomington. Thank you, you'll have three uh, minutes, go ahead. Yes, uh, so first and foremost, I would like to uh, address the fact that the way that the council has set up their Zoom meetings uh, by disenabling the group chat so that we can all comment on things as it's going is a Gestapo-like control of, of public comment. Um, it would be very easy to just open that up and allow us to make comment as things are going. You can save it in the record. You don't have to look at it. It is, it is insane that you're weaponizing Zoom in this way, guys. So change that. Second of all, um, uh, I would like to talk about uh, Chief Dekoff's uh, disconnect with the idea that his police officers are not in and of themselves a threat of violence, a threat of arrest. They 100% are. He's, he's schizophrenic about how he's characterizing their presence. And in particular, for Black and Brown and Indigenous people in our community, the mere presence of the police, as BLM has been saying for a very long time, is a threat of violence. Least we not forget all of the murders that have commi been committed all over this country by the police uh, uh, against black and brown and indigenous people. Least we not forget that BPD in and of itself arrests black and brown people at higher rates than white people for the same crimes. I would also like to address this idea that the, par the people who are were living in the parks, the people who are homeless are more prone to drug use than anybody else. I would ask you to talk to the officers at Indiana University and ask how many times they are confiscating drug paraphernalia from students at Indiana University. Ask them how often drug and alcohol abuse is, is happening at Indiana University, okay? Because it's, it's this insane idea I would also like to talk about the fact that the mayor uh, is continuing to double down on his intensely wrong thinking and his, his support of the richest people in Bloomington and ignoring the rest of us. It, it is so gross at this point that it is, it is high time we come up with a mechanism to recall him from his office because he is completely and absolutely incapable. And Mary Catherine Carmichael, as the wing of uh, the, the mayoral administration, also doubling down on this disgusting idea of, of homeless people being the problem here. The problem is homelessness. Homelessness is the problem. We have the ability to solve that in our small little town. We could be the model that all of the other towns look to, but we constantly and consistently choose not to do that. And it is a racist and classist ideology not to move forward with allowing people to sleep in our parks That's until we can find a better solution. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next up is Callie. Uh, would you please state your full name? Should not be able to unmute. Callie. Hi, sorry, Callie Taylor. Um, please go ahead, you'll have three minutes. Okay, I just have a question. Um, I, when I first heard about this for Salzos, thought it was for camping in public parks, in the parks. And then I believe I heard the presenter say in a public property. And they had the map with the radius from the beacon and community kitchen. And I wondered if they could provide a map that showed all the common area or the common spaces where people would be allowed to camp if this passed. Um, 
my next comment is Centerstone is in the process of building a apartment building, a 50 unit apartment building on Kinzer with um, one and two bedroom apartments. And I wanna know how that's going to, um, how it's gonna affect the people that are camping now, how many of those people are going to be able to move into that apartment building. Um, my last question for the council at some point is I believe there's a fund with the city that some of the developers who have been building the apartment buildings for campus have um, paid into, and it should be a pretty large sum by now. And what the city is doing with those funds that I believe are to be um, used for people, um, low income people and housing for people and what those funds are going to be used for and when they're going to be used. Those were just my questions to be addressed um, at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is John Fernandez. Mayor Fernandez, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks a lot. I appreciate an opportunity to um, add a few comments here. And I sent the council members um, um, the rationale for why uh, I, along with my uh, wife, Karen, have uh, concerns and oppose the ordinance. Uh, but rather than reiterate that, I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I want to make it really clear that I really encourage the city uh, to continue working with other organizations, public, private, nonprofits, to uh, provide a solution here, uh, particularly a, a temporary solution while they, we strive toward a more sustainable solution, uh, because this is a really complex problem. Uh, someone raised a question earlier about I guess the uh, respective um, or relative um, engagement of this administration versus prior administrations towards addressing uh, this problem. And I, and I can say, I think with a little bit of authority that I think this administration has probably invested more than uh, at least the prior two administrations when it comes to uh, direct investments in uh, permanent uh, affordable housing solutions. I think one of the problems with this ordinance and, and the reason I'm concerned about it is that, um, you know, it focuses on using parks for uh, this purpose. And, and as such, it really unnecessarily creates conflicts uh, between members of the community. It just seems that we can do better and we can find a, a better alternative um, than, uh, you know, pushing this on parks. Uh, so that we could have a, you know, a solution that has access to potable water, toilets, uh, easily accessible to other service providers, so that we can actually provide the support that the uh, folks who are homeless need uh, while we get behind a more uh, comprehensive uh, solution. And I, I certainly don't pretend to be an expert on homelessness, but I do know Bloomington, and I, you know, I believe it's an incredibly generous community. I've never seen Bloomingtonians uh, fail to, re, re, to rally behind uh, serving the needs of the most vulnerable people in our community. Uh, this ordinance, though, in my opinion, unnecessarily divides Bloomington when we should be united around a more robust solution. And just for the record, I, I actually support the changes to the zoning ordinances. I think that uh, our current laws restrict the vast majority of Bloomington land uh, for single family housing and that creates a big part of our affordable housing problem. So we do need to address the whole range of policies that impact access uh, to affordable and diverse housing options in our city. I do have some uh, questions and maybe I'll just follow up later with them, but uh, just a couple of quick questions I'll try and hurry through is one that, you know, I've heard a lot of reference to this ordinance being based on the Indianapolis solution. I'd just be real curious what are the facts are. Has, that ordinance was adopted in 2016. Has it helped uh, reduce uh, the homelessness issues in uh, the city of in Indianapolis? Um, I mean, that's some data that we ought to be able to get at. I, I saw the data during the initial presentation about not necessarily increasing uh, the point in time numbers, but it has Sorry. that it actually solved the problem. And I'll, I'll submit the other questions later. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll go on to the next speaker. Uh, next up is the screen name MHC. Uh, who should be Would able you please to state me? your name for the record? And also, I'll take this opportunity to point out that if there is more than one person on a Zoom call, uh, please let us know. 
uh, if they if they are planning to speak. Uh, but MHC, if you can please state your name. Yeah, my name is Sarah Kehlane. Um, I'm the Director of Development at Motherhood with Covered. I'm also a member of the Affordable Housing Commission for the county. And I'm going to read the statement we wrote today that we sent to all the council members um, in support of this ordinance. This ordinance offers a bare minimum of protections for those experiencing homelessness by codifying pieces of a process recently taken by the city. It offers clarity on a notification process and timeline securing and retrieving personal items and includes collaborating with local service providers and experts in the community. This is the very least that can be done to respect and protect our homeless neighbors. We understand that there is opposition from the mayor and his administration. We find it appalling that anyone in a leadership position in our community would oppose these basic provisions of protections for our most marginalized community members. Does the city administration understand what a risk it is, especially for women, children, and trans individuals to have to sleep outside? And why, if you must sleep outside, it is necessary to do so in a park, in a public setting, under a light, where the minimum amount of security and safety could be had. Mayor Hamilton and his administration have shown a lack of care and decency by fear-mongering to homeowners associations about encampments, quote, in quotes, and also in quotes, the unintended consequences for neighborhoods while ignoring the very real consequences for those experiencing homelessness. What kind of community are we when we prioritize those who might witness injustice and be made uncomfortable over the actual injustice itself? We should be disturbed by the fact that there are people in our community whose only safe option is to sleep outdoors and not direct our fear and anger at their very existence by trying to criminalize their survival. Our energy should instead be focusing on examining and challenging the systems and structures in place in our community that create these circumstances. This last year has been devastating for many, including, including our community. We would hope that this collective experience of loss due to the pandemic would cause us to recognize the value of every member in our community and not just those with the most expensive homes and the loudest voice. We urge the council members to pass this ordinance and to continue to actively engage with those experiencing homelessness to support their needs. And that is from the staff of Mother Hubbard's Cupboard. Um, another comment I have on the comments that the city made about funding this year, um, the funding that they're that they talked about are, uh, are programs that they have every year. The only thing that was different this year is that they offered COVID funds, which was through the CDBG fund and, and Jack Hopkins as well. So they're, the programs that they're talking about are things that happen every year. It's not in addition to address this problem. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. That's your time. Uh, we'll go to the next speaker now. Next up is Nate R. Mr. R, would you please state your full name? Hello, my name is Nate Rosenblum. Thank you. You'll have three minutes. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to address some of the points that I think people made during this meeting. Um, it's come up several times that the city wants to work with community organizations, um, to address the problem of homelessness. Um, it, the city does not feel like it has an obligation that people are housed, it seems like, um, which I may personally disagree with, but I can see where they're coming from. Um, I think it's notable that some of these groups uh, are on this call in support of this ordinance, um, including Beacon, which opened the winter shelter recently. Um, those groups aren't the people, aren't rousting people from their beds in the middle of night, nor are they seizing their property. Um, the community cannot make it legal for uh, people who are unwilling or unable to uh, stay in a shelter or who do not have homes to sleep in a public space. Um, only the city can do that. Um, I'm frustrated by people saying that this is moving too fast. Um, this is a stopgap measure. It is, it is um, not moving 
towards a solution is preventing more harm from being done. Um, I think we would want to move quickly to prevent, uh, prevent people from being harmed. Um, I, I think that's all. I just hope that um, you all can find it in yourselves to support this ordinance. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Kyle Duggar. Uh, Kyle, du I don't know whether it's uh, Citizen okay. Duggar. Please go ahead. You'll have three minutes. Hey, thank you. Um, my name is Kyle Duggar. I've been a Bloomingtonian. I've lived here for the last uh, 13 years, I guess. And I just confirmed with Google Maps by looking at it that I've lived within one mile as the crow flies of Seminary Square Park for all 13 of those years. Uh, I didn't plan on making a public comment tonight. I don't have any kind of a pre-written statement. Um, I guess I was just sort of appalled and a little bit grossed out by the administration's arguments and response to the ordinance tonight. And I felt like I had to sort of get on here and weigh in. Um, it seems to me that we're having a <laughs> this sort of unchangeable problem where people are going to be experiencing homelessness here. So whether we make it illegal to camp in parks or not, there are going to be homeless camps. The only question that we have is uh, whether or not the people who are camping outside are going to be close to public restrooms and access to hot meals and access to medicine and access to service providers or whether they won't be. And that seems to sort of be the real question. I think it's tough for people who um, try to be generous in the community and support people who are experiencing homelessness by trying to give them things they need. And then knowing that there's a real possibility that within the near future, the city's gonna raid their encampment, take things that people have donated and you'll see them in the trash later. <laughs> um, it's just sort of a, like a tough cycle that I think that the, the question isn't just whether there's going to be outside or not. Um, and I guess, you know, the city of Bloomington talks about what they're doing, but Kinzer Flats isn't open. Um, people have been told they were going to be able to move into Kinzer Flats in January. Then they told they were going to be able to move into Kinzer Flats in February. And Kinzer Flats is a great idea. And I think that, you know, I support it. But the thing is, it's been cold outside and Kinzer Flats isn't open. So people are going to need a place to sleep. I mean, it. it regardless of whatever anyone decides, I think people are going to be outside. It's just a matter of whether or not we criminalize the conduct or we let them be accessible to us. And uh, I know there's not going to be a final decision tonight. I just hope everyone considers that going forward and uh, thinks about that before we have the next session. Thank you. Uh, if I have any time left, I would yield it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Reverend Forrest Gilmore. Reverend Gilmore, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> um, thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm the executive director of Beacon. And it's good to be with you all. Um, for me, I think it's always important, important to talk about values. And for me, um, whenever making a hard decision um, or even an easy decision, I start with values. And for me, the, the most important value, I think, is... is um, is uh, supporting the most vulnerable in our community, supporting the least of these, as, as Jesus put it. And um, that really cuts to the core of, of what drives me and, and what motivates me. I also um, am a big supporter or try to be of our, of our um, constitutional republic and support uh, and try and support what it uh, calls us to, at least at its best. Um, I, think, I think we're kind of missing a little bit of the uh, core central point about this ordinance. This ordinance is not a solution to homelessness. <laughs> it's not in any way a solution to homelessness, and I don't want it to be presented that way or suggested that it, that it is that. Um, what it, this is is, is a, an attempt to decriminalize sleeping outside. And uh, I think why that's so important to understand and so important to really think about is, um, is that that has actually be, been deemed um, 
the criminalization of sleeping uh, outside has actually been deemed uh, unconstitutional, a violation of the Eighth Amendment as cruel and unusual punishment. And uh, and we, we've heard very clearly there's some debate about whether this is criminalizing, but truth, but we know, again, if you refuse to leave, uh, as someone who's experienced being arrested in a park for, for trespassing, um, it's, it's a real thing <laughs> and you do get arrested and it is a thing. So, so we are currently criminalizing sleeping outside. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that and that this ordinance attempts to do that, to undo that. Um, and, and it's been upheld by the courts. And so, so I want us to deal with this in a proactive way as opposed to getting to a point where it might end up in the courts for us. I really, really don't want this to end up in the courts for us. I want us to deal with this collectively and proactively so, um, so we can get a, ahead of avoiding anything like, like that. Um, the other thing I'll say about this is this ordinance doesn't uh, take away any prohib prohibitions around littering or around violence or around any other, you know, uh, rule that makes sense for the parks. Um, it's really just about sleeping. And um, all those other rules are still in place. All those other things would still be enforceable. And so what we're really doing is um, currently is by, by banning sleeping in the parks is we're in essence saying because some people in your group are behaving in a way that we don't like, we're going to create a rule about everyone in your group. And that, that is the active definition of discrimination. And so we need to pay attention to these things, these precisions of the way that we um, embody these rules and the way we're, we're uh, doing this. And lastly, I'll just Governor say- Gilmore, I'm sorry, that's your time. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Nicole Johnson. Ms. Johnson, I have three minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is Nicole Johnson. I'm the director of Pigeon Hill Pantry and the vice secretary of the Bloomington Housing Authority Residence Council. 50 years of a housing crisis clearly shows lack of local leadership in reaching both local and short-term short and long-term housing goals. Uh, it is not cold all year round. Winter shelters are not permanent shelter beds. The unsheltered and housed community booms in spring and summer because services go away. They will still need to sleep. This is not about belief as this city likes to keep talking about how they don't believe it's their problem. This is about logic. And this is ultimately about your laws. I was one of a group of B-Town residents arrested while sleeping in a sleeping bag inside of the Four Street garage the year the city was discussing the parking meters. We did this in protest of empty space for cars and not people. We all hosted an encampment for weeks inside the garage, and when they decided, they being the police in the city, uh, decided we needed to go, they came and arrested us, and we were tried, and the charges were ultimately dismissed. Um, some of you spoke of officer discretion and that no one was arrested out of seminary. Two people fled seminary and were arrested that night in their tents. They were approached and searched for trespassing, charged with SUD-related charges, and brought to jail. And then, of course, not charged with trespassing, and only those SUD charges, their probation was revoked. They are now stuck there, even though we have their bail money raised. I am currently working with one of them to try to get him into rehab, which is where he was trying to get the week all this happened, and while he preemptively fled, and why he preemptively fled, fled seminary. He was given absolutely no medical services for withdrawal in, Mo Mo in Monroe County Jail, and I'm curious, as officer's discretion, why stride was not an option. Also, just today, my unfunded services were requested by a director of a program at a well-established social service. She wondered if I would be willing to be one of her clients' social security payees. 
it's not our social service agencies who aren't trying to be as creative as they can be and collaborate with community members to make their own strapped ends meet. And so now I'd like to end with this. First of all, space, oh, guess that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's your time, I'm afraid, thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Molly Stewart. Ms. Stewart, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Molly Stewart, and um, I'm with the Bloomington Homeless Coalition. And a lot of people before me have said a lot of the things that I was going to say. So um, I would like to start with responding to what a few people have said about this particular ordinance not really um, being ideal. Yeah, it's not ideal. And there have been many solutions out there that the city has chosen not to pursue. Uh, I know that city council members have been trying to find something that would be within city council's authority to make a, any kind of solution pass. Um, so much of the power in this town is concentrated in the mayor's administration. So yeah, it's not ideal. It's pretty much the only thing that they could do and no one else is doing anything in terms of city government, which in my mind is responsible for every constituent's health and safety, including homeless people. Um, on that note, I would like to represent some voices from the homeless community since uh, there are a lot of misconceptions being thrown around tonight, especially by city council members who clearly have never had a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with someone who's homeless. So um, I think that we need to respect the right of people who choose not to live in the way that the rest of us live in homes where we pay rent and we have private space and private property, which we may or may not own. Some people don't choose that for themselves on purpose. Not every homeless person is a drug addict. Not every homeless person is a criminal. And some people choose to live differently. And I think we should respect that. Um, the Bloomington Homeless Coalition has supported many, many people who live outside during this winter. Some of them are only still alive because of the services that we have provided. Beacon knows that it cannot support people who choose to live outside. They support us, uh, you know, not financially, but they give us moral support for supporting those people that they cannot. Um, I just, you know, I, I can't really talk about individuals because um, of their own personal safety, but I have just met so many amazing people who have created amazing homes for themselves in tents where they have warmth and they have friends and they have happiness and love around them and they have decorations and they have you That's know your time i'm afraid miss stewart thank you thank you next speaker please next up is uh talisha Kopic. miss Kopic, go ahead you'll have three minutes hello hi my name is uh talisha Kopic, and uh you know this is one of the uh toughest times in our community uh with many people and businesses hurting um we uh work with downtown bloomington inc and have been involved with uh helping revitalize our downtown since 1984 and um you know just over the last few years we've heard uh many comments from long-term residents employees 
customers, employers, um, you know, with just serious uh, concerns about some of the uh, downtown environment. And they've all tried to work uh, very hard um, with uh, working with uh, different agencies and um, providing some help and being caring and understanding. Um, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, they've had past experiences uh, just most recently with Seminary Park with the camps and before that with uh, People's Park a few years ago um, with uh, multiple issues, many of those same issues of security, maintenance, um, dealing with multiple issues uh, with different people and personalities uh, and, um, and issues that um, you know, they're just ill prepared to, to handle. Um, and it, um, it's, uh, it's sad. And, you know, the different social service agencies have been great that we can refer people and try to help them, but it's kind of a day-to-day -day issue. Um, you know, whether you're opening at 5 a.m. in the morning or closing at midnight at night or, um, you know, just security is a really, really important, uh, thing in the downtown. Um, and it, you know, it may not necessarily be someone who's homeless. It could be other issues as well. So I want to kind of separate some of those issues. Um, but you know, one of the big questions and, and concerns with this ordinance and its implementation is, you know, who helps monitor the areas surrounding the parks or the public space, and you know, customers, and what's the liability for the surrounding areas if someone's hurt. Um, you know, or overdoses. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a tough time for a lot of people. And, um, you know, our downtown tries to be welcoming to all. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it's a mixed use area. And, you know, people that frequent it and operate in it need to follow rules and respect other people all the way around in order for it to all work and all of us to get along. And, you know, Bloomington is a great community that works together. And, you know, we have so many services uh, um, for different folks. And, uh, you know, where are the gaps? And I think that's what this ordinance is trying to say is like, there is a gap in this area. Um, but we've got you know, multiple challenges facing our delicate downtown ecosystem, um, you know, with businesses struggling now due to the pandemic, employers wondering whether they're going to come back or not. I'm afraid you know, that's your time, Ms. Coppock. I'm, um, I'm sorry. Ms. Coppock, I'm sorry, that's your time. a lot of work for many, many years that, you know, we must all do. Ms. Coppock. What we can do to support a safe and stable, Ms. Coppock. reliable. I'm sorry, that's your time. Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go to the next speaker, please. Next up is Mark Teller. Uh, Mr. Teller, please go ahead. You'll have three minutes. Hey, everyone. It's Mark Teller from the Bloomington Homeless Coalition board member. Um, uh, I want to start off with saying Bloomington Homeless Coalition is a obvious coalition of housed and unhoused folks that give voices to the those who do not have voices, those who do not have houses or homes. And everyone you are hearing from that is representing the Bloomington Homeless Coalition is housed. As always, I'm always going to reiterate this, we do not have the technology to go to everyone that would like to speak to you right now. There are plenty of people that are huddling in tents right now waiting to hear how today went. Um, and I'm not going to put you guys through uh, what we've tried before where we have one representative there handing around one phone. We all know that was disastrous. Moving on. Um, I have a lot of stuff I do want to talk about. I could go on for probably three hours, not just three minutes. Um, several things on this. First off, obviously the Bloomington Homeless Coalition fully supports this ordinance. Um, not only fully supports it, but this was a, reading it was a breath of fresh air. Finally, someone is writing something that we can get behind and they're asking us for their, for our opinion. Um, I would welcome more of that, obviously, uh, but it is what it is. Um, one, it is up to the administration to determine the area. Um, so all this debate 
about where, when, why. This literally gives that plate to the administration for them to say, okay, this place works, this place doesn't. Um, it gives the city a path to proper, humane ways of getting everything they want, meaning the unhoused out of sight, out of mind, uh, while honoring the obvious needs of our unhoused neighbors. Uh, it will clearly establish a zone that will not affect business or residential areas. Again, up to the administration where they can say, no, that's too close to housing. No, that's too close to businesses. So that's kind of in their court. Um, and until homeless, homelessness ends, there will always be people living in these tents. Why would you not want them centralized? Let me give you a good example of what centralized locations for these people uh, can do. Just the other day, we had that big blizzard where everybody freaked out. Nobody left their houses, right? Unfortunately, some people didn't have houses, as you know. And we at the BHC received calls that tents were starting to collapse. One of them actually almost burned. They didn't burn, but almost burned. It was left to the Bloomington Homeless Coalition to get out there in the middle of the blizzard at nine o'clock at night, that night, there was already eight inches of snow, I know because I was the one driving, to drive all the way across this town to literally save someone's life. He couldn't call 911. He would have been arrested for trespassing as the chief of police so reluctantly admitted could happen. And Sorry, I wanna talk Teller, about that, that as well. That's your time. During the face. second eviction, Mr. Taylor, I'm sorry, that's okay. your time. All right, thank, thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Sarah Erickson. Ms. Erickson, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge um, the work that the members have put into this uh, ordinance and urge them to keep working and pushing ahead. Uh, the uh, Mayor's office has worked very hard to uh, undermine all of the work that you've done and made it, make it seem like it is not ready to go. I really urge you to keep working and just know that there are people pushing for you that believe in you. I'd also like to acknowledge the hundreds of hours that community members have volunteered to pick up trash for free around Bloomington for people facing homelessness or just people who have homes that is littered all over the streets. I'd like to acknowledge that the figure that I believe was $800,000 or something of the like that was mentioned by city staff, uh, Mayor Hamilton staff, as the amount of money that was given to uh, people facing homelessness. And I'd like to ask if everybody uh, in that office is uh, operating their personal lives and their beautiful warm homes that they are zooming in on tonight under that $800,000 budget. And if they could all live on that, just as seven to six, six to seven people. I'd like to finally speak to your compassion and humanity for everybody that opposes this. I hope that you will work with the people who brought this uh, to your desk and bring it up to speed so that it can work for our community. Community leadership sets the example for how compassionate and people forward its constituents are. The responses from the community and business owners only indicate to me that leadership has failed to step up and provide that example. People are afraid of the homeless because of the constant propaganda our electric fish officials throw at them that ingratiates the idea that homeless people are to be feared by house people. Someone left, I want to uh, acknowledge the comment that someone left adult diapers in their business bathroom and left a mess and they spent hours cleaning it up. I'd ask that they turn to their government and not to people trying to resolve that issue working for your government. Turn to your government that turns down ordinances like this. They have failed that person and you because there are no public bathrooms. Someone who is incontinent, unable to control their bowels on top of being homeless has to undergo what I can only imagine is a shaming experience of sneaking in somewhere to use that restroom. Mayor Hamilton, has failed the homeless people in this community and its housed and business owning members by not doing anything significant to give people basic human rights and throwing the work our community members tirelessly pour themselves into out the window. And that includes the, the council members that have done all the work to put this ordinance together. I hope the other council members will make a step towards compassion and lead our community that way and eventually follow up with re real resources. 
this is a stopgap. That's correct. But every minute counts for these people. And if you don't think that, I'd like you to spend a night outside and tell me if every minute doesn't count and if a stopgap isn't something that you would like to see, if you did not have the privilege that you all have by not facing mental illness, uh, substance abuse disorder, or anything else that is not just those two things. That's that your time. Into homelessness. Thank you. And I thank you. Passion. Next speaker, please. Next up is Danielle Bird. Ms. Bird, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Danielle Bird, and I'm a Bloomington resident and a social worker. I've lived here since 1988. So I want to urge you to approve Ordinance 21-06 because it is the very least we can do to mitigate some of the harm that is done to people who are unhoused. This is not a solution for homelessness. However, this is a stopgap measure to decrease the criminalization of people who are unhoused. When I arrived in Bloomington in 1988, as uh, Dan Combs started uh, mentioned, we were starting to talk about it. Uh, since that time, I participated in many advocacy efforts regarding homelessness. And I'm holding a copy right now of a report that came out of a charrette process for Region 10 that we paid a consultant to coordinate. Ironically, the report from 2014, uh, there were lots of plans. Uh, it says to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-repeating. We have made some progress in Bloomington with some of these initiatives. However, I can say with certainty that people have been criminalized for being unhoused in Bloomington for years. I remember Glenn Carter, and many of you on council remember, I'm sure, um, he was asking back years ago if maybe we should have giant helium balloons so that we could float above the ground so that we could live without being criminalized. And at the time, I just kind of thought that was a little bit radical. And now, uh, as I get older and I continue to see this, I see exactly what he was saying. Um, I want to repeat what Mr. Booker said uh, earlier this evening, which criminalizing homelessness is the most expensive and least effective approach. Sweeping encampments is not a best practice approach. The issue really is about our priorities. So when we consider this issue, I encourage you all to consider the following. How much sheltering or housing would $546,000 pay for? That was what Chief Decoff said. That was, those are the personnel costs to deploy police and social workers to Seminary Park. Um, and what good are all of these referrals to services if the services are maxed out? I mean, here we've got uh, service providers uh, reaching out to mutual aid providers asking for help. What good are all these referrals if the services can't even meet the needs or provide housing? So, you know, let's think about our priorities and where we're spending our money. How much money could we raise by selling the Bearcat? Uh, how many units of housing are available for low or no income people? Um, what will happen when the winter shelter closes? I mean, where are those people are going to go? They're going to be in the parks. Um, and where can a person legally exist who is unhoused? And I believe that's been asked several times. Our shelters are full. Our social service agencies are maxed out. Mutual aid efforts are stretched to capacity. Sweeping encampments causes harm. It makes people more unsafe. It's immoral. So I ask you to all look at your priorities. Let's choose morality here in this situation. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is the BEDC. I believe that's uh, Ms. Pearl. Am I correct there? Yes. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Pearl. You'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Jen Pearl, and I'm the president of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation, or BEDC which is a nonprofit dedicated to the retention, development, and attraction of quality jobs for all of Monroe County. Thank you for today's informative dialogue, hearing feedback, and working to connect with us. The BEDC is concerned for individuals experiencing homelessness in our community. We appreciate the efforts to tackle the com this complex problem, but feel that Ordinance 2106 is not the answer. This position is based on a member survey we conducted early this week, answered by 30 respondents from local employers, and 77% of respondents agreed with this position. We feel Ordinance 2106 is not an appropriate solution for four main reasons. One, our employers have experienced negative impacts from encampments, 
and this ordinance would permit camping within certain public spaces. Employers have reported needles, human waste, and trash both in public spaces and on their private properties in the vicinity of encampments. Camping and trespassing has also taken place on employers' properties, leading to added costs for cleanup or security at a time that many businesses have been strapped by the pandemic. A couple of employers reported staff being followed or threatened by individuals around these encampments or in the corridor extending north and south from Seminary Park. To be very clear, this feedback is focused specifically on the recent effects of encampments, and it's not commentary on the broad community of unhoused individuals. Second, there are issues with the ordinance itself, including questions around whether the city should provide these services, lack of details around the responsible city department, fiscal impact, available budget, administration, and program evaluation. Third, the ordinance does not effectively support our unhoused neighbors. Converting our parks into encampments does not address the problem. We feel it's inhumane to expect unhoused individuals to sleep in tents in the elements with unpredictable weather conditions. A cross-sector collaborative regional effort is crucial to address the systemic and underlying causes of homelessness. The BEDC supports long-term solutions, including the work of the Homelessness and Housing and Stability Initiative of the Community Foundation and United Way. And then finally, quality of life is central to a healthy, vibrant community. Welcoming safe and clean public spaces attract employers, visitors that support our businesses, and talent that relocates to our community. We promote our parks and trails to prospective employers. Um, one survey respondent recently reported difficulties recruiting people to Bloomington when they've seen these issues. While we feel Ordinance 2106 is not the solution, we have an opportunity to address this challenge together as a community by finding solutions that respect the needs of all community members. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Kay Goodman. Uh, is that the letter K? K-A-Y. Citizen Goodman, please state your name. Hello, everyone. I am just going to start off being blunt because that's that's how I am. I am a social worker here in town. I work for, I've been on the front line for years. I work with the unhoused daily. I am completely in support of this ordinance. This is a great message we are sending to our community, that our marginalized community that needs our help. Every day, I work to try and house our marginalized and homeless. Here's what's going on. Application fees, administrative fees. Do you have a past? Never, never talking about the future or what they're working on now. You've got to understand this has so many layers to it. We need affordable housing. We can't throw that, those two words around without making sure there aren't barriers so that they cannot get housed. And I would like to address the city. You had a chance. You had a chance to not evict from Seminary Square and you did it. And I, am so upset with the city to always talking about social services. We are wonderful, we are vital. We have been on the front lines through this pandemic and deflecting to us and saying we can solve all the problems is wrong. We cannot do that. We need your help. Pass this ordinance and help our community. They are hurting, they need hope. Sometimes just a little ray of sunshine will motivate people to do great things. And I'm not saying they're not doing great things. They're surviving. They're surviving every day knowing that they might be arrested for being homeless. They're surviving every day by going to every pantry or getting a hot meal just so they can survive another day. So I challenge the city to step up Step up and help the homeless, the unhoused that cannot get ahead or cannot be safe. We need this. They would be safe. And I'll tell you something else about our marginalized people. They help each other. They will be there in times when no one else is there. 
They are there for each other. They empower each other. They enable each other to get ahead. They, they help get, you know, get up every day. And that's what I have to say today. And anything I can do to help this ordinance, I would like to say, I will be there for it. And I, that's, I, um, that's how I feel about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is uh, Lindsay Dominguez, who should be. Ms. Dominguez, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you for having me. I'm one of the directors of the new small nonprofit Hotels for Homeless that Box mentioned earlier. Um, H4H has sheltered at least 50, probably more plus people. Um, experiencing homelessness on an emergency basis in empty motel rooms after the parks were cleared um, and last week during the extreme deadly cold. Um, in addition to the 20 to 30 individuals and families that we shelter on any given day, regular basis, weekly, monthly, um, we have sort of become a a middle ground for people who um, don't have anywhere else to go because we're extremely low barrier. Um, and we just want to say thank you to the authors of this ordinance for bringing it forward. And thank you for allowing these public comments on the topic. Um, and I'd like to say that we support this ordinance and we are ready and willing to work with the city to make sure that the ordinance that gets passed, should it get passed, um, provides for everyone in a realistic and a positive way. Um, as it stands now, it seems like there are a lot of things that need to be worked on and tweaked, and um, we are happy to help with that um, in any way that we can from bringing stories, real life stories of real people to you. Um, uh, we have lots of stats. We've got a waiting list currently comprised of over 200 people. So when those point in time numbers come up and it is, oh, 34 people in one place at one time, that um, is just not realistic to what we're actually seeing. Um, so we'd be happy to provide that information as well. Um, I think just about everything else I wanted to bring up has already been touched on, um, except for the fact that there's federal funding for these exact types of situations, specifically HUD emergency services and solutions grants, which I looked up online and which Bloomington did not receive. Um, according to the HUD website, every other large city in Indiana was awarded these grants in 2020 to solve these specific types of problems, including Evansville, Fort Wayne, Gary, Hammond, Indianapolis, South Bend, and Terre Haute. I don't know if our city didn't apply for these or what the circumstances are there, but it seems pretty ridiculous um, when the government wants to give cities money to help, especially during a pandemic. Why aren't we jumping on this opportunity? Um, so I think many of us would appreciate if this was addressed and answers as to why Bloomington did not act on this to serve our community. Um, we would appreciate some answers. That's your uh, time, I'm afraid. Now, that's your time. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Alex Goodlad. Mr. Goodlad, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. So I want to, you know, um, you know, my whole mantra about my belief that the mayor's administration is not really operated in good faith. And rather than do what I usually do, which is like cuss everybody out because I don't think city council is doing a great job. Thanks. Thanks for listening and doing what you got to do. But um, the city, I don't think is operating in good faith on this. So, you know, get this ordinance through. The city has no room to talk about um, rushing this because they, they rushed the tax bill. They had all the time to talk about the tax bill. They, they, they just, you know, procrastinated two weeks to talk about it. So I don't want to hear about um, 
rushing this, especially because it's a false equivalent. Like, like it, you can't even equate it with taxing. Here, there's a sense of urgency. And let me let me get to that. So uh, enough about the city. Um, and tell Jim Sims that, you know, for once I didn't cuss in the comments, so he'll be happy. So I, I want to uh, talk about the last, you know, two-ish minutes I have about um, personal responsibility, because I've, I've heard the points that basically the city is making, which in a nutshell comes down to the community is what's personally responsible for the homeless, which is kind of a rebranding of the common, you know, conservative talking point uh, when it comes to this issue of homelessness that, you know, pull yourself by the bootstraps. This is what, you know, it's a hard knock life. That's, that's what you got to do. So, um, so I, I, I think from that perspective, so let me try to sell this ordinance from, from that perspective, which is, which is that, so, sorry for stuttering. I, okay. Um, I, I like one thing that like for, first, the first thing you got to realize is that I, I, I mean, like the city talks about how, you know, there's, there's no help for the community and, and or, or that they turn down help the homeless people, but the city right now is turning down help that if this ordinance is passed, there will be people who have literally offered to pick up the trash cans and et cetera. And let me just mention all that, you know, I as, you know, someone who helped with the Bloomington Homeless Coalition craft the uh, petition, all we asked for were just trash bins, which cost peanuts and porta potties, not, not full toilets. Don't let Paul McDevitt fool you. That costs nothing. And, 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 and then, and, and then, you know, work towards housing first, which they talked about. And then finally following the CDC, and like, that's the other thing that I only have 10 seconds to talk about, which is that the CDC needs to be adhered to. And like, there, it's not, everybody's getting COVID. And with this ordinance, people won't have, like it'll be mitigated like it was before. I yield my time, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next up is Jacob Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz, you'll have five, three minutes. Please go ahead. Oh, dang, I was hoping for that five years. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. All righty. So I'd just like to start by saying that this is the easiest trolley problem in the world to answer. On the one side, you've got people who are dying, who are sitting out in the streets cold. On the other side, you have people saying, oh, I don't like how it looks when there's homeless people around. That's the equivalent of saying it is a moral good to not pull the lever and let somebody die if the alternative is somebody getting their shoes wet. That's pathetic. And if you're voting against this, I'm sorry, but you lack a moral backbone. Um, Secondly, um, I'd like to go to some statistics from uh, the city of Albuquerque. The University of New Mexico did a study tracking 95 homeless people who are housed by the city for the course of at least a year, some up to four years. And I get that this ordinance is a bare minimum stopgap, as other people have said, but this is what could happen if we actually wanted to go that extra mile and actually do something for these people instead of stopping, instead of just stopping at no longer terrorizing them. Uh, in the city of Albuquerque, to house these 95 individuals, it costs about $250,000 a year in housing and social services. However, this also led to a reduction of uh, $98,000 less per year in ambulance costs, $201,000 a year less in ER costs, $1,378,000 less in inpatient care, $42,000 uh, $42, less a year in outpatient behavioral care, $140,000 a year less in outpatient medical care, uh, $31,000 a year less in uh, jail expenses, and $73,000 a year less in shelter expenses. It was a net positive of $1.1 million saved by housing these 95 individuals, as opposed to the previous cost of leaving them on the street. It also showed that these individuals who were housed by the city uh, had up to a one half or were in prison or had interaction with the police up to as half as much as they did previous to this program. The evidence shows that going further than just like letting them sleep in the park is beneficial not only to the things that um, we were talking about earlier that were talked about earlier of crime and of other things. It saves money. So if you don't even have the moral backbone to support this out of a pure humanitarian uh like support, then go for the economic benefit. Go a step further for the economic benefit. That's all you care about. You soulless business people who only care about the environment around your business and not the people suffering on the streets. If Mark Teller wants the rest of my time, he can have it. Thank you.
Next speaker, please. Uh, next up is VJC. Uh, can we, you please state your full name? Yeah, hi, I'm Vijay Tramamilla. I'm a student at IU Bloomington. You have three minutes, go ahead. All right, hi, I'm Vijay Tramamilla and I'm a student at IU Bloomington. And um, I'm ultimately in support of passing this ordinance, but I would first like to speak about my personal experience with the homeless community. I've been a volunteer at the Shalom Center for about um, eight months now, since August of 2020. And I've had nothing but positive experiences with the homeless community. and. As someone who lives in Bloomington year long and pays taxes here, I am deeply disgusted um, that the actions that took place in January um, and December with the raids on the homeless um, on the homeless tents took place. I I cannot believe that Bloomington has strayed away from um, a leadership approach of compassion and responsibility and taking. Um, sorry, compassion and responsibility, and almost decided to embrace one of a strong man. You know, just this last year, we've seen how um, being transparent and being compassionate can really pay off in places all around the world from New Zealand to South Korea. But instead, you know, when the raid on um, the encampments, as the mayor called them, happened, no one took action. The buck didn't stop anywhere. Um, and you know, it's ultimately the city's responsibility and no one wanted to, to take responsibility. And that's why I think that the city council has a moral responsibility to make sure that the events that happened on December 9th and January 14th mm. never happen again. And you know, this, this ordinance isn't perfect. It is like a, lot of, like a lot of people have said, it is not going to solve all the problems, but it is a great measure for this moment in time. And um, I would like to stress this moment in time because I think passing this ordinance is urgent. I, I don't get this, um, this talk about deliberation and, um, and making sure that this legislation is perfect. I, I wanna prevent the mess that happened on December 9th and January 14th from happening ever again. And, you know, if this, legislation stops that and if this legislation increases the rights of unhoused individuals in our community then i'm good to pass it i don't see where the where this um constant need for deliberation comes from um and i think it's it's time that bloomington decides to be an inclusive place where everyone can find a place in the community i mean you can't say that you're a city with a bunch of diverse cultures and you're accepting of everyone if you do this to the individuals in your community that are unhoused. Um, I yield my time back to the chair. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is uh, Zach Mueller. Mueller, you should know. Sir Mueller, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi there, thank you. Um, so my name is Zach Mueller. I'm a 15 year plus resident of Bloomington at this point. Um, I want to thank specifically council persons, Piedmont Smith, Rosenbarger and Flaherty for their work on spearheading this, uh, this ordinance. Um, I just want to talk about a couple things really quickly. Um, I was kind of taken aback when uh, the esteemed deputy mayor, who uh, I wish to congratulate him on his early retirement, which is certainly well deserved, was referencing that thank heavens it's warming up because it's February and it could absolutely snow next week. And so for everybody to talk about, we wanna you know, just de delay here, like our, our, house, our, our houseless brothers and sisters could literally have another 18 inches of snow dumped on them in you know, the time it takes for me to have to trim my nails again. Um, guys, this is, uh, this is kind of preposterous, frankly. Um, that we're talking about needing to hold on. Um, you know, uh, our city all, uh, and our government, um, you know, I do think there is a moral responsibility for us to really move forward expeditiously here. We can be flexible and agile and solve problems and uh, reallocate funding when we need to, uh, you know, to allow for budgetary ex uh, purchases within discretion 
when uh, say a police department has an extra two hundred fifty thousand dollars lying around and they want to buy a brand new armored personnel carrier, we could, we don't have a problem with that. Um, we allow them to do that. Uh, we talk about needing to allocate funding uh, and uh, you know the five hundred plus thousand dollars for those uh, employees that we have. Uh, you know, there's there's two hundred fifty thousand we could stump up next time that we want to have discretion there. I think. Um, you know, I, in short, um, you know, I know I've not got a lot of time. I think that what this really boils down to is uh, money and nimbyism in, you know, just the plainest terms. You know, I think that all people and I'll be the first to admit I am I am an, uh, a fallible human being. I've definitely avoided eye contact with my, our houseless brothers and sisters at points in my life. And I'm working to you know, be a better person about that. I think every person here has probably done that at one point, And we all have to reckon with that. Um, you know, but right now we're not avoiding eye contact with these, you know, folks. We're dealing with a lot of people who just want a, a safe place to stay. And I think that um, there's a lot of good work happening here, but we as a community have an obligation to do this, folks. Um, you know, uh, if not us, then who? We, you know, uh, our elected officials, we elected you to represent the people, and that's not just the, the people with money, the people who uh, several years ago circulated a, a, a email talking about the Bloomington Bum Brigade, uh, excuse me for that, uh, it's everybody, you know? And so uh, help, our, help our brothers and sisters out who are uh, you know, in danger. We can do this if we really want to. Uh, I, I really would hope that we can you know, move expeditiously here. It's important. It could be cold again any minute. Thank you. Thank you, that's your time. Next speaker, please. Next up is Sam Waterman. Uh, Hello. Um, Ms. Waterman, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sam Waterman and I am the president of College Democrats at IU. And I'm here to express my own uh, personal support of this ordinance and also my organization's support for this ordinance. Um, I just most importantly would like to urge everyone here tonight to consider how close we all are uh, in reality to homelessness. All of us are just a few tragedies away from losing our shelter and uh, in turn losing our dignity. I grew up seeing my own relatives reaching out to my parents asking for financial assistance when they face tragedy, like we all do. Um, my own relatives who work hard for what they had they're good people. They face tragedy so bad that they have almost lost everything. When our unhoused community has their belongings taken from them and they're forced from a place that they personally feel safe and they're forced into shelters that they may not feel safe in or may not feel welcome in because of their identities. I'd urge you to imagine your own family in that position as I have. I'd like you to imagine your family losing that last shred of dignity at, that ha at the hands of their government. If that were your family, you wouldn't be acting as flippant as you are right now. You'd be giving them the resources that they need to succeed and to keep them off the street. It's time to humanize the homeless and to give them their dignity back. This ordinance might not solve every problem we face today, sure, but what it does is it gives them their dignity. It acknowledges that the, the homeless are people. It gives them the help that they need right here and right now. It's not tomorrow, it's not next week, and it's not next year. We can't keep pushing this problem off. If no steps are taken right now, we will keep abusing these members of the community. These members of the community will keep dying. If when when I see the homeless, I see my uncles, I see my aunts, and I see my cousins who I love so much and who deserve dignity. It's not enough to say that the problem of homelessness is too complex to solve with one ordinance, and so we shouldn't even pay attention to it right now. The solution is not to throw up our hands and to do nothing. This is just step one, and this is step one so we can actually get to a more comprehensive solution and get to our ultimate goal of giving these people the respect that they deserve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is uh, Tina Honeycutt. Uh, Ms. Honeycutt, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this is Tina Honeycutt and for the council members, I have promised I will be here to speak up for our neighbors that are unhoused each time we meet. So I am keeping my promise. I am here to tell you um, 
one of the things I know is that it's very easy for people to say we need more data, we need more time. And our neighbors that are houseless don't have more time. And we need to do something that encompasses all of the folks that are dealing with homelessness. And we need to stop talking just about the lawlessness that we see and the problems and talk about the solutions that have been implemented. The number of solutions that have been had by mutual aid organizations during this pandemic so it can be done and it can be done a lot better if we had actual collaboration with the administration and respect for the fact that yes there are some issues that have to be dealt with and it can be difficult when someone has mental illness and you're not an expert but since you're not an expert quit talking down about people and quit talking about them as if they are expendable as if their right to sleep somewhere doesn't really exist because we also heard everyone say that why why they're really against this is because there isn't transitional housing available, there isn't permanent housing available. So there really is just shelter space and there's not enough of that. And if, if you have not stayed in a shelter, you cannot understand why one might choose to sleep outside. So perhaps you should go stay in one of the shelters so that you have more firsthand experience. You should go speak with our neighbors, with the siblings that are our community members. Have some conversations. And yes, they may be angry. And you may have to hear some of that. There may be cursing. That's part of listening and learning from each other. Pass this ordinance. Do more and do it now. That's your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is uh, RM, I believe, Renee Miller. Ms. Miller, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Um, I heard a lot. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Renee Miller, I heard a lot about responsibility from the city admin. Remember, whether you pass the ordinance or not, you as a city are resp already responsible for each and every person within the city limits. So when something happens to an unhoused neighbor now, you can be found negligible, full stop. If one is only looking at data to support a side or something of something, then you are not really looking at data fully. This strategy is used to support a decision that one wants to make when a mayor, for example, said they do not support something. This is called confirmation bias. Look it up, confirmation bias. Also, when one says there is no solution without trade-off, then they are not looking for a solution where the trade-off is positive, but expecting the trade-off to be negative, sadly. Many cities throughout the country are finding positive ways to address the homeless crisis that is now face, has been facing us for a long time. Look at the data, look at all of the data, not just your supporting data. <clears throat> the city of Bloomington needs solutions and until then ordinance 2106 is necessary. Passing this ordinance will not only extend protections to the houseless, but will also help within neighborhoods and the city as a whole by designating a specific area and space that provides trash cans <clears throat> and collection, as well as crucial bathrooms 
So the city won't have the same problem it has seen in the past, wherever that designated property is, gives a person a place to lay down their head, a place to sleep, a place to exist, is a human right. I don't know which council person just yawned, but that tells me you're not listening. By giving them a designated place, we do not outcast them into the city as a whole without resources and support. The mayor's staff suggests that this ordinance will do harm to the neighborhoods. Now there are homeless people throughout our city and neighborhoods that have no support systems at all nearby and are continually moved along. This does cause harm. This ordinance will save the taxpayers money hand over fist. Imagine now, imagine you as a council member saying this, these people matter. These people with names and life experiences, they count. They deserve dignity and respect. And I, as a council member, see you and I am saying you have a place to go, a place to belong until transitional housing is available. You are worthy of dignity and respect. <clears throat> Make thoughtful change to our city ordinance by passing 2106 by not doing so you say some of some are worth more than others. Tell me what it's your time, Ms. Miller. I'm sorry. The um, next speaker, please. Next up is uh, Dylan Crone. You should be ready to comment, Mr. Hello, Crone. Can you hear me? Yeah, you'll have three minutes. Go ahead. Oh, excellent. So, hello, my name is Dylan Crone. Uh, I was raised here in Bloomington 26 years ago, um, and I'm happy to call still call this home. Uh, while I moved away from home, my wife and I have just bought our new house a few blocks away from Bryant Park. Uh, the goal of this ordinance, and I've heard it many times tonight, is for it to be short term. The sponsors of, of this ordinance have stated this, the Bloomington Homeless Coalition have stated this, and, and many others. However, if we have persons who are not willing to go to shelters and who will not accept the help that at least I see is abundantly provide, how can we assure this ordinance will not become the long-term solution? I envisioned a, I envisioned a plan where this ordinance that creates a campground and parks becomes a long-term solution. And in my opinion, it's not acceptable for these persons. They deserve better than that. I disagree with the, continue, the city continuing to state that this issue is not theirs. And I commend the sponsors of this ordinance for trying to find an issue. I really, really do. But I fear this ordinance will create more issues in solving a solution to this problem than it will solve. I don't think our public parks are the place for those experiencing homelessness to call home. So my question for the sponsors of this ordinance, and I know we probably won't find or hear answers tonight, but I would love to hear it in our next meeting, our next public outing, is how do we ensure that this solution or this ordinance is the short-term solution and does not become the long-term solution where we have camps or we have campgrounds on public parks for years and years and years to come. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up, I have two comments from uh, folks who sent in uh, messages over the chat that I've been requested to read. Uh, the first comment is from Dave and Linda Stewart, uh, who say that it was made clear early on in this meeting once camping was allowed in the parks, it would uh, not be able to, uh, the city would not be able to stop camping in the parks. Uh, therefore, the ordinance is for camping in the parks now and in the future. <laughs> Allowing camping in the parks would forever change the park for the worse, and the park is a commons for all to share, not for people to camp in. And the next comment comes from Emily Pike, who says, thank you for your consideration of this ordinance. As someone who has spent many years working with vulnerable populations, I am heartened by this council's and this community's willingness to have a hard conversation about a difficult topic. I understand the concerns that some people have expressed about feeling less comfortable in their parks and neighborhoods. I also understand very well the fear and shame and alienation that people experiencing homelessness feel in our community all the time. Whether or not we decriminalize sleeping in parks, we know that some people experiencing homelessness will sleep outside. Dedicating a space for them to do, uh, to do that lawfully allows us to reserve other public spaces, better protect private property owners, 
and most importantly, better protect and better respect some of our most vulnerable mem members. This is one of the ways we can live up to our ideals and aspirations to be a compassionate, welcoming, and inclusive community. Thank you for your work. Yeah, that is the Thank you for that. Who is our next speaker? The next speaker, I believe, is Kathy Crabtree. Ms. Crabtree, you have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Kathy Crabtree. I lived in Bloomington over 30 years. I support this ordinance. I wanted to start by thanking council members Rosenberger, Piedmont Smith, and Flaherty for authoring it, and more importantly, for reaching out to those who have experienced homelessness and the Bloomington Homeless Coalition and getting their input into the ordinance. That's a good model for good government. I am frankly appalled by the multiple members of the administration who have basically said tonight that the welfare of the public is not the job of the government. Um, that's not what I learned in school. I don't, I'm not sure where they took civics. Uh, I'm also appalled that the administration reached out to the neighborhood associations with half truths and misinformation what, in what appeared to be an effort to stir up fear and opposition to this ordinance. All, as the ordinance says, all persons experiencing homelessness should be entitled to protection from arbitrary and capricious treatment by local government. It's sad that this needs to be stated and that it needs to be put into an ordinance. But if you've been paying any attention over the years and more specifically, the last few months, apparently our mayor needs to hear it. The treatment of those experiencing homelessness in Bloomington has not only been capricious, but it's also been cruel. Ms. Guthrie mentioned or stated that Bloomington is known as being progressive. I would say that a few folks have self-designated Bloomington as being progressive, and I've not seen any evidence for years that this community is progressive. So maybe we need to relook that. And also being considered progressive in this state is not really a very high bar. I asked city council to pass this ordinance as an important first step in righting the many wrongs that have been happening. And it must only be a first step that we take towards making this community a safe place for all of our neighbors, not just the affluent and the privileged. Homelessness should not be a crime, period. I ask you to please pass this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Nora. Could you please state your full name? Yep, certainly. Uh, so my name is Nora Weber. I'm a graduate worker at IU Bloomington. You have three minutes, about, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and I live about four blocks from Seminary Square. Uh, so I support this ordinance and I'd like to start by thanking the Bloomington City Council members who are sponsoring this ordinance for doing so and for their thoughtful comments this evening. Uh, like many others, I was extremely disturbed that particularly in the midst of a global health crisis, it became a priority in Bloomington to further destabilize the living situation of people who are experiencing homelessness. I think the suggestion from several council members and other public servants this evening that this issue falls outside of their purview or expertise, uh, that sentiment disregards that people experiencing homelessness are among the people that you took a vow to serve. Uh, promoting safe and equitable housing in Bloomington is absolutely a core service. And for some council members to say that they won't pass this ordinance and also aren't responsible for seeking a long-term expert informed solution is to suggest that people experiencing homelessness don't merit their recognition or service in the same way that other people in Bloomington do. Uh, as a final note, I'm concerned by some people's repeated use of language that stigmatizes homelessness and the people experiencing it. As several other commenters have mentioned, homelessness is the result of structural inequality and requires structural change. But it also requires immediate action and ensuring designated and legal space for housing is a critical step as we move toward a sustainable solution. Uh, so I encourage you as strongly as possible to support the ordinance and to prioritize acting to help extend to everyone in Bloomington access to safe and stable housing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Heather Lake. 
Ms. Lake, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, okay, so I have a whole bunch of pages of notes, so I'm going to read them really fast. Okay. Um, so the average rent in Bloomington has gone up $300 from 2007 to 2017, and we have the highest housing price in Indiana. Um, also, uh, um, 7% of people in Bloomington have a disability, but 46% of the homeless have a disability. Um, and 65% of people have no health insurance, so they cannot buy medication to help them with their mental health problems. Um, there is also the closing of TCF, which is a transitional care facility, which was providing short-term um, housing for people to get into long-term housing, and now that's been closed. Um, for COVID-19, it's more dangerous for unhoused people, plus packed shelters lead to COVID outbreaks. It was said that 400,000 new units would have to be set up US-wide for COVID safety. Also, um, federally supported Housing programs have dramatically reduced in the past 20 years and also safety net programs. Um, so during the pandemic, Center Stone closed the building. So mental health services then needed a computer or a phone and getting checks from FMS, which is the financial services they provide require an address. So that means 46% of homeless were unable to see their doctor uh, to get counseling or to get medication. Um, we're, as opposed to uh, COVID-19, self-quarantine, social isolation, and stay-at-home orders are impossible to do when you do not have a home. Um, and 400, oh, sorry, I said that one already. <laughs> um, so, Ah. Oh, and also there are local zoning ordinances that exclude affordable housing as well. So I think this ordinance needs to be passed so that people can have a place to go. Um, also, I researched that Kinzer Flats was started construction October 7th, 2019, and yet it's still not done. However, Echo Park Apartments where a one bedroom is between $1,200 and $1,400 a month was done in six months. Um, Rent.com, if you look on that, at $500, no units are available. Um, I live under the poverty level. If it were not for locking out at Section 8, I would not have a place to live and would be among the homeless population and would most likely be judged by you and also by business people, because sometimes people with different brains act different. That's your time, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is uh, Tassie Ganady, who should be ready to unmute. You'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Sure, my name is Tassie Ganady. Um, I work with the Bloomington Homeless Coalition. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, speak to several points. Um, one was I was doing some work outreach work today. And when I pulled up to Shalom, and I had my windows down, and everybody sitting in front of Shalom yelled, Tassie, as in like Norm from Cheers. And I, it just warmed my heart, like I'm almost tearing up thinking about it right now. Um, these really are people who are amazing and wonderful people, and who know the value of the kinds of work that we are all putting into them. And I think that they are really looking up to us to help provide some solutions. Now I want to flip the script. Um, at one point, someone uh, asked uh, Councillor Piedmont Smith um, about the park and safety in the park. And I can tell you from having gone to Seminary Park um, almost daily for several months that I was never more scared then on January 14th, when there were 30 police officers there to evict the remaining tenants. People had left because they were afraid. Um, we were there in mass, and yet we didn't know if we would be arrested. And I'm a white, upper middle class 
um, person. And yet that was the most scared that I had been. Um, there were still belongings on the ground because they couldn't take it with them. And that's the other thing. So these people who had left or who had gone wherever did have to abandon things. And we need to really think about what kinds of um, damage and trauma we're inflicting when those kinds of occurrences happen. Um, and finally, I'd like to speak to other cities that have enacted ordinances like this, like Vancouver, Washington, Missoula, Montana, Denver, Colorado, and Kalamazoo, Michigan, where they have some encampments and services um, providing wraparound um, support to those while they try to seek other solutions. Albuquerque, my hometown, which got a beautiful shout out um, for not only its humanitarian response to these folks, um, but also the way in which it saved city money, has also instituted, um, it's just opened its first tiny home enclave, which maybe could be the second step, because so many people have been talking about this as a first step, and what if, and what if. Um, and so they have recently welcomed their first guests um, in the midst of this very pandemic to these beautiful tiny homes. Um, I certainly hope that we can we can expand our services the way that libraries across the country have employed social workers, the way that other cities have taken on the challenge and that we can rise to meet it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up, we have uh, email address Rob Rank at iu.edu. Can you please state your name? Uh, yes, my name is Max Coleman. Okay, uh, well, that's not the email address, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, three minutes, please go ahead. I'm using my boyfriend's computer, sorry about okay, that. Okay, that's um, fine, go ahead. So I'd like to make three comments. Um, first of all, um, Isabel Piedmont-Smith uh, asked several times the crucial question, which is, where can people sleep? Where legally can people sleep? And there was a, a long silence before uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Mick Reniason eventually said, quote, I'm not sure that one of the core service areas that we feel like we need to get into. I'm gonna say that again. I'm not sure that this is one of the core service areas that we feel we need to get into. Um, that is a stunning statement from an elected official. This is not someone who's saying, I don't know if we can, you know, we'll try our best, but we're not sure. This is someone who's saying, we don't feel like we need to, to handle this issue. That to me was a stunning statement and I really hope he didn't mean that. The second thing I'd like to say is there's been a lot of discussion about mental health and homelessness. It's just so complicated. We don't have any experts on hand. Um, well, if I may uh, be so pretentious, I'm a sociology PhD student. I specialize in the social causes of mental health and the social conditions associated with it. And I know that one of the most important factors for quality mental health is good sleep. Lack of sleep, uh, on the contrary, is associated with stress and anxiety. Uh, for everyone, and for, for certain vulnerable populations, it can result in manic episodes, hallucinations, all sorts of serious problems that only compound the stressors of homelessness itself. Um, and I should also say that there's lots of reasons people don't sleep in shelters, some of which have been named. Maybe you've been sexually assaulted in a shelter and you're afraid to go back. Maybe your mental health symptoms are such that you're gonna be kicked out of a shelter. Those are some things we have to contend with. And the third thing I'd like to say is I'd like to encourage those of you who are on your cameras to look at the other, look into the other homes of the people who, who you see. Look into these homes and think about the well-apportioned, presumably warm homes in which you're living right now. And think about the people who aren't part of this conversation, which are mostly, I assume, uh, people who don't have houses and they, they aren't sitting in their comfortable homes on Zoom. And I'd like to remind ourselves, I'd like us to remind ourselves that these people are not being represented in this conversation. And yet, and yet of the people who've spoken today, there have been, I've been counting 26 people supporting this ordinance and only seven opposed. That's stunning, a stunning ratio, 26 supporting and only seven opposed. So please, please do support this ordinance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Catherine Blake. Ms. Blake, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to say too much. I mean, I want you to support the ordinance. That's why I'm speaking. Um, I don't want to repeat too much of what's already been said by a lot of excellent people, and I don't know how to follow up uh, that great comment um, uh, by that sociologist just a moment ago. So I'll just say that I support the ordinance as an obvious harm reduction measure. Um, I think that it probably does need some work, but all legislation goes through work. I don't see that as a valid reason to reject it wholesale. 
I think tonight was definitely a moment to find out who is going to be, you know, supporting this in politics and who's going to stand against it. And I think it's very clear that the mayor's office does not have any interest in making sure that uh, people are adequately housed um, and within the city of Bloomington. It sounds like they'd rather expel them or have them arrested. I think there are some really excellent people on city council who seem to be interested in this problem and really a lot of excellent citizens. So I think, I mean, what I'm hopeful of is that we will get this work done without the mayor and without the Chamber of Commerce and without the Economic Development Commission. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it is gonna be a lot harder because you people insist on standing in the way and not being honest about your intentions and saying you mean to help when you have the resources, but you won't offer them. And so I think that the very least you could do in these cases is move aside and let progress happen and not be the people who stood in the way, uh, like so many before you who are also business owners and people of privilege, um, not end up in a textbook about, you know, people who nobody in a hundred years can understand their motivations. I think that um, you can just sort of go away if you don't want to help and let the good community members sort this out and pass this legislation. And whatever help city council needs, I, you know, I mean, I can't do much, but I'd be happy to help. And I'll be definitely continuing to listen to these conversations. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, next up is Jonathan Wunro. Mr. Wunro, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. And I appreciate the council members and the 117 people that have hung in here the last four hours. I live on the corner of 9th and Maple across the street from a city park. And I wholeheartedly support this ordinance because of so many, as so many others have said, it's the least we can do. Homeless people do not have the luxury to wait while the city and committees and commissions discuss this for months and months. We have vulnerable homeless people tonight. Those of us on these committees and commissions will all spend tonight in our warm and cozy beds. So we've got all the time in the world to resolve this issue, but it's because we have roofs over our heads. These neighbors are not campers. They are homeless and they're struggling. They're not on a camping trip. They're homeless and sleeping in a public visible space is much safer than forcing these people back into the trees and back into the shadows. By the way, we already have designated spaces in our parks for special interest groups. They're dogs. We have several dog parks, but we're unwilling to designate space in our parks for the most vulnerable humans in our community. The city is a tree commission and we have a sidewalk commission and dozens of other commissions, but we do not have a homeless commission. It's about priorities. It has been so disappointing tonight for me to hear city staff and the deputy mayor express either a it's not my problem approach or an out of sight, out of, sight, out of mind approach. It is your problem. It's our problem, and the city should be taking the lead, not following, to provide solutions, now not later. If city staff don't have the expertise, or don't have the resources, or don't have the staff, then we as the citizenry need to expect that the city take the lead. We need to demand that the city do this. The city already has most of the resources it needs to address this crisis. It's our city parks. Our parks have land, Apparently we have 38 parks full of land. Many of them have potable water. Many of them already have restrooms that could be winterized. It makes more sense to me that we work with the resources that we already have. I'll close by saying I support this ordinance because I support my homeless neighbors who are in crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is uh, Quentin Deppert. Mr. Deppert, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Quentin Deppert. I'm a senior at the O'Neill School, um, and I'm also a longtime Bloomington resident. So um, let me be clear. I support uh, Ordinance 2106. I would like to see this passed. I think um, I agree with most of the people here that this would be a boon for the homeless community, or it would, it would at least improve their circumstances. Um, so I guess we're going to start, um, 
designating, and I quote, certain limited areas on public property where camps will be allowed. And those des designated areas are to be within a mile of a shelter, and that shelter should provide restroom facilities. So in subsection A, the city, the city still reserves the right to displace people from the parks if they determine a public health emergency, emergency or otherwise is occurring, as long as they give 15 days notice. The mayor and the chief or the chief of police can declare an emergency and uh, they actually can do that at their discretion without a 15 day notice. So I wanna be clear, eviction is still possible in the parks with this ordinance. And um, these are public health emergencies that they're most concerned about. Now, if we all wanna prevent a public health emergency, then um, we need to not just allow these camps to exist, but I do wanna see the city um, take up some uh, actions to you know, provide more trash cans, uh, I want to see them actually taking out the trash every time uh, the trash cans are full because apparently community members found themselves doing that uh, this year, which is um, not their job. Um, and again, I support this ordinance and I want to thank the council members who proposed and support this ordinance as well. I'd like to see it passed. I know the mayor holds a lot of power in the city and the council is doing what it can, I want it to do more. And I definitely want the, the mayor and the chief of police, Dietkoff, to do more and not um, declare a public health emergency um, without a 15 day notice. Uh, I uh, cede my time, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is uh, Alicia Mojarad who should now be ready to comment. Ms. Mojarad, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, yes, uh, my name is Alessia Mojarad and I'm a student, uh, District 2 resident, and I serve as president of the College of Democrats of Indiana. I strongly support this ordinance and hope that um, people on this or city council members on this call um, will be voting for it whenever the vote does come up. Uh, throughout this call and numerous prior conversations I've had with people, I've seen certain city council members and the city uh, administration constantly off ramp responsibility regarding issues in the unhoused community. First, I hear that it is not the city's job to find out where people can legally sleep in response to um, Isabel Piedmont's uh, question. I hear that it is not one of the city's core services. And I even heard city councilor Ron Smith spread irresponsible statements by fear mongering and asking about safety numerous times. Well, I'm a 5'3", 20-year-old woman who volunteers weekly at Shalom to provide lunch, and not once have I genuinely felt fear. Turns out that when you respect and get to know those in the unhoused community, they aren't scary. They aren't, quote unquote, the other that we need to, to be uh, shy away from or be afraid of. And to the city council members who do not want to vote affirmatively on this ordinance, I'm genuinely asking why. Is it actually because of safety? Is it actually because of a potential financial burden? Or is it because it would tarnish the beautiful yet fake view of Bloomington that we all have and it would ruin relationships that you might have with business owners um, and other landowners uh, like property managers? Honestly, over and over again, I hear people on this call say that they want the best for the unhoused community, that this is the long-term goal, yet when provided an opportunity to vote on an ordinance that would do just that, people are shying away and they're hiding under these fake guises. And honestly, I'm looking at a city council of nine Democrats and I consider myself to be a Democrat and I think that Democrats are compassionate, good people. But I hope that uh, after this call and potentially if you vote no on this ordinance to reevaluate what you call yourself as, because I don't think that a Democratic City Council member would genuinely be voting on this because we want to help the people in our community. Um, honestly, I'm not sure how much time I have, but I think we all need to have a little bit more compassion. Um, I don't think anyone has brought up the fact that we are currently in a pandemic uh, where people have lost sources of income, have lost their homes, have been seriously injured and have died. And yet this is the fight that we choose to pick, right? Like out of all the things that we could be doing for Bloomington in our community, we decide that 
uh, this month, the last couple of months, Mayor Hamilton decided that he wanted to start a fight with the unhoused and uh, unhoused community in Bloomington. And that's frankly sad. And the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, 2023 in the primary election is a lot sooner uh, than we all think. And I hope that you're considering your vote right now um, and that election. And I do know that everyone on this call will be remembering what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Andrea Mills. Ms. Mills, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am Andrea Mills. I am speaking on behalf of the Bloomington chapter of the DSA. Uh, Bloomington DSA supports increased protections for people experiencing homelessness. We call on Mayor Hamilton, Mary Catherine Carmichael, and the Office of the Mayor to stop campaigning against this ordinance immediately. We recognize housing rights are interconnected with racial justice, social justice, and economic justice. And we believe the research that confirms LGBTQ plus youth and BIPOC are more likely to experience homelessness. This new section 28.010 expresses the purpose and intent of the chapter, which is to lessen the adverse effects and conditions caused by lack of housing. We are only here tonight because the city chose to, and um, I'm going off of the DSA official statement. Um, I did a summary of that, but I sent the full statement to the city council this afternoon. Um, but in addition, these comments are of my own. The only reason we are here tonight is because the city chose to intervene during a pandemic and pay the P Bloomington Police Department to dismantle and raid encampments on December 9th and January 14th. I do not believe that this ordinance would be a priority for city council had that not taken place. The CDC guidelines require individual housing. For any of you who have the option to share a bed inside of a facility where other people are sleeping versus staying in a tent of your own where you have privacy, um, I think it's a, I just don't understand what that, um, false equivalency is. We have parks for the benefit of the public. We're in a pandemic and our public is hurting and needs these spaces to be used. Um, so I fully support this amendment. Um, Mary Carmichael stated that the city does not have expertise in this area. We have heard from several experts in the community who are, um, who are working with the public and they uh, are in support of this ordinance. The only, um, the only community uh, resources that I found against it are the ones that represent the business like the Chamber of Commerce and the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation. Um, personally, I'm disappointed. I had actually uh, worked for the Chamber. I had actually uh, come to Bloomington to start a business on the square um, and was working with the BEDC at one time. And so I am really disappointed that they put the um, economic benefits over the needs of the people. Um, so that is, this is the, um, I second that it's the easiest trolley problem to solve. Let's not disrupt people who are just trying to live and trying to sleep during a pandemic. Let's do what we can. And the bare minimum would be to not arrest people sleeping in the park. Um, I, That's your time. Two words, Bearcat, and leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Martin Law. Mr. Law, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you for, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I want to thank all of the, I want to thank the uh, sponsors of, um, of this ordinance, uh, uh, both for putting it forward and for your uh, speaking on behalf of it uh, in this meeting. I really appreciate all of your words. Uh, to to the, the rest of the city council, um, I think it's going to be very important to remember that this is not an ordinance in support of people sleeping in parks. This is not an ordinance in support of creating encampments for people. Um, I think Forrest Gilmore really, um, I, I, I think his summary was, was very you know, astute, that this is about uh, how we treat the people who are already there. 
this is not an invitation to more people. And as the presentation that started uh, uh, suggested, it won't create more people uh, 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 sleeping in our, our city parks or wherever, whatever designated location uh, is, is, is um, established. This is about how we are choosing to treat the people who are already suffering. I think that's a really important distinction. A lot of the people who are opposed to this seem to be under the impression that if this ordinance is not passed, you know, uh, uh, um, people who have nowhere to sleep <clears throat> inside uh, will simply go away. That also is not true. If you are concerned about people without homes sleeping on your private property, giving them an alternative seems like a wise way to go. If yeah, and so, so again, to the city council members, if you are concerned about your constituents, you know, your constituents are concerned about um, people without housing sleeping on their private property. Well, you can resolve their problem by supporting this ordinance. This ordinance will give those people somewhere else to sleep comfortably. So I, I think I think you know what what I really like about this ordinance is that it seems to serve everyone's interests. The last group that that seems to have opposition to it is the administration, the mayor's office, and I think a lot of the objections they came up with uh, make a lot of sense. But they are the sorts of things that ought to be debated by city government. A lot of the things they were bringing up is, well, how are we going to pay for this? Well, how are we going to staff this? Well, where are we going to get the expertise? Those are terrific questions. And those are exactly the questions I want my city government to be wrestling with. So I think, you know, supporting and passing this ordinance makes a lot of sense and then allow city government to do what it does. For there to be discussion between the city council and the mayor's office on how we actually get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Carmen Parker. Can you please identify yourself? Good evening. You have Angela Parker here. From Carmen You'll have three Parker. minutes, Ms. Parker. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I was born in Bloomington, pretty much lived here my entire life. And uh, I wanted to chime in with just a few observations. I mean, obviously, there's just a fundamental disconnect uh, in the role and the philosophy of the city on this topic. Um, but beyond that, and obviously that's got to get resolved, but beyond that, I have some, just some pragmatic concerns about this proposed ordinance. Um, and on the question that was raised just a moment ago and throughout this evening has been this notion of fiscal impact. And it's stunning that the council members that are presenting this ordinance uh, have characterized it earlier as it cost, quote, next to nothing or minimal financial impact and then admit that they have no data to report or inform about that question. Um, and based on the response to that, it's clearly in dispute. I don't know how we can pass legislation and not understand what these unfunded mandates look like. Uh, secondly, I really do wanna encourage the council members to read the comments that are embedded in the chamber's uh, press release that was released. And I know you all got a copy of it. Um, there are costs to this problem and to this proposed solution both lost opportunity cost and actual cost um, that strongly impair abil uh, the business's ability to continue to function. These are real, these are compelling. Uh, we shouldn't ignore these. I mean, these are good community members, a large segment of our business owners, property owners, and community members that have to be included in this discussion. Effective law balances these interests, and I would urge the council to do that. Uh, I submitted a letter today on behalf of 32 other people who are our local property owners and business owners, and so uh, what I'm saying today represents those interests as well. I'm not going to repeat all those, but based on a lot of, of what's in that letter and what's discussed here this evening uh, form the basis for our request to oppose this. No one is suggesting that we ignore the population that, of, of these suffering folks or try to fail to show some compassion on this issue. Um, I sort of resent being accused of failing to have compassion. And the difference, I think, is how we get there. And I'm concerned, lastly, about the practical effect, the implementation, and what Council Member Flaherty talks about this reasonableness standard that we're supposed to intuitively know and understand. 
that's not how we make effective legislation. It has to be evidence-based. It has to be well-supported. It has to be clear and defined. And I think this ordinance is deficient in those categories. Um, again, we've got to balance the interest, consider uh, what the costs are. And as a topic, we do agree that it's imperative that this issue be addressed, but we do not believe this is the right approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Nathan Mutchler. Mr. Mutchler, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, you, sometimes the best words to argue your case is not the strength of your argument, but the weakness of those who would argue differently. So I would just like to draw attention to the categories of people that the previous spoker, previous speaker uh, sort of sorted people into. Business owners, property owners, AKA, if I may put words in their mouth, their kind of people, the good people, and the homeless people. It, it's troubling to me that members of our community would divide the voices of us and to think that business owners and property owners aren't represented in this process. Um, at the very beginning of this, uh, I believe it was Council Member Rosenberger who, who talked about how everyone sleeps and what we're trying to do is give people somewhere to sleep. And I wanna thank all three sponsors of this ordinance and I strongly support it um, because when it's framed that way, what we're talking about is are our citizens going to be able to live in Bloomington? Um, and so to go back to the very beginning, I believe it was Chief Decoff who said, I'm not sure it's the city's job to say where people could sleep. That is essentially saying, I'm not sure it's the city's job to say where people could live or breathe or exist. These are human rights. We're not talking about choices. We're talking about things people are. People are sleepers. Um, I believe it was Council Guthrie. If not, I apologize to her, but it was one of the city people who also said this ordinance would attract uh, essentially marginalized people from across the region as if it would be a bad thing to be a community that people want to travel to, that people want to move to. I think that it is fair to say that the Chamber of Commerce has a stated goal of attracting people to Bloomington. So it seems to me a very troubling argument to say that even the people who oppose this, it, it, would they say it could attract people, but just not the right kind of people, not our sort of people. And that should be very troubling to all of us, if that is the best argument that the city can come up with to oppose it, that it, it's not our business where people can live and that it's not for our kind of people. Again, I strongly support this and I wanna thank all the sponsors for bringing it forward. And I'd like to thank the council in advance for what I hope is a unanimous vote to pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment, Mr. Lucas. Yes, next I have a request uh, from Chris Sturbaum to read a comment that he sent in. Uh, the comment reads, there are answers, but giving away core neighborhood parks with no real hope of uh, meeting criteria to end the camping in the parks has so many downsides. The practically irreversible loss of these public parks is a huge public loss. The neighborhoods will be aghast if we really allow this to happen to Butler Park, Building Trades, Bryan Park, Waldron Park, and Switchyard Park. Uh, maybe there is a space that could be allotted uh, so it isn't in neighborhoods. And that's the end of the comment. And I believe our next speaker is uh, Anani, who should now be ready to comment. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Ananya. Um, can, you I've been state, here can, you state your, can you state your full name, please? Ananya Mani. Uh, thank you, you have three minutes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I'm totally in favor of de decriminalizing homelessness. And I think at the same time, we also need to answer a few questions. You know, 
you know, I, I understand, you know, it's a, it's a very precarious situation. Like nobody should be homeless while we're in the comfort of our homes. There should not be anybody outside sleeping in parks or something. I think we also need to question um, or need to gather some data as to whatever community resources are there, like Shalom Center and other centers, whether homeless people in the city are even utilizing it or all of them are utilizing it. If not, why are they not utilizing it? Uh, at the same time, I would also like to pinpoint my personal experience with family members who I go out, you know, to the share park. Um, there have been certain instances where I wouldn't say personally, I've, I've felt unsafe at any point of time or any, anybody in my family member, but I think it's also coming to a situation wherein do I really need to, you know, look at needles in the park while my child is playing in the park? Uh, and I'm kind of concerned. I totally understand that the situation should not be there, but I'm also concerned for my child. And I would not say from the perspective of safety in terms of somebody's going to harass us or something like that, but I'm just concerned about the safety of my child. And there, there have been two instances where I had to personally pick up needles right outside of Switchyard Park, and which was, I was kind of appalled by the situation. So we also need to really consider what can the city do and whatever resources in the community that are available, how can we help these people? But I'm in totally, totally in favor of decriminalizing people sleeping in the parks. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, are there any other people who have not yet spoken to this issue? Not that I see, no. All right, we are just past oh, 11, sorry. Apologies. Late request uh, from Meg Anderson. Is this a written or a spoken request? Spoken, I believe. You're, uh, you'll have three minutes. Could you please state your name? Thank you. It's Meg Anderson. Can you speak up? You're hard to hear. Oh, um, Meg Anderson? Yes, Can please. you hear me? Yes, now it's better. Go um, ahead. I am in full support of this ordinance um, and so grateful to everybody who's spent all of this time and hold the, held this space. And um, a week, I don't know what goes on in the centers and why individuals decide to camp instead of go into those spaces, but um, I, I just feel that it is, a, it is absolutely a humanitarian issue and we need to focus on making sure people make it through the night, that they have the emotional support for, to, to even think about putting together a list of skills that they might get a job instead of putting together a list of places where they need to go and if the cops show up in the middle of the night and decide that they're trash that needs to just get swept away um to be treated like that is you know it's just this ongoing trauma that when we i don't know why we're comparing this ongoing trauma to people's need to play in the park, um, people's need to, you know, get their bottom line met in their businesses. It's not to be compared. Um, we need to take care of these people and we need to do it now. And I, uh, that's really all I have to say. I'm, um, I hope that we can be on the right, right side of history and I hope that we can really act in a humanitarian way and go on to step two, three, four, um, and clean it up. Um, thank you. Thank you. And with that, we're gonna close public comment for the evening. Like I said, it's a few minutes after 11 p.m. Uh, this is a committee of the whole. Uh, it's, so it is just a committee meeting uh, and we could go to another round of questions as it would be our normal procedure. And then we could go into council debate. Um, I strongly 
want to recommend to my colleagues that we simply go to a second committee of the whole in two weeks, uh, because there are, uh, I believe, many questions and issues that we should uh, address with the appropriate amount of time. But uh, barring that, uh, is there anyone who would like to make a motion as to how to proceed? Because otherwise, I'll simply go to questions. Councilmember Sandberg? I would not like to go to another committee the whole. I, uh, I don't have any additional questions. I think we've heard quite enough this evening, uh, but uh, final comments probably at this point and then a due pass vote would be appreciated by me. Any thoughts to it but from anybody else? Uh, I'm, Mr. Flaherty? Yeah, I'm happy to have comments and a due pass vote. I'm also happy to um, end our discussion for this evening, but take up the matter at second reading next week. And if more time is needed after that uh, meeting, we could always postpone to a third reading or go back to the committee of the whole at that point. I would prefer that as opposed to simply um, going to committee of the whole again in two weeks. Thank you. I'll just point out that uh, we have an obligation to make a recommendation to the full council, whether that be move to pass to uh, take it up at another session or the like. So uh, that's what I'm polling my colleagues for right now. Any other thoughts from members about how to proceed? Councilmember Scambaluri? Yes, thank you. I appreciate um, Councilmember Flaherty's thought that we could. Next week will give us, just as you mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, Councilmember Volan, that next week will give us additional opportunity um, to look through questions and, and to seek responses. I think we have an opportunity and comment tonight as well. For those of us who would like to see more information, we can ask for it tonight and specify what it is we're looking for. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it's likely or unlikely that we would be ready to vote on this next week. Um, but I would agree with Council Member Flaherty that we need not automatically send it to another committee of the whole. So thank you. Um, I, I'm reminded by um, uh, Mr. Lucas that um, we are limited in what we can do um, uh, by code. Um, the only motions that are in order during committee of the whole are to amend, to adopt via due pass recommendation, or to rise and report, which is to say that we make no decision. We simply report on what we what was decided. So that might inform uh, your uh, decisions as to what kind of motion to make. Are there any other thoughts about how to proceed from my colleagues? Councilmember Scambaluri. Could you restate those three options again, please? Yes. Uh, we, it's according to BMC 204-250, we, the only motions in order are and during committee of the whole are to amend, to adopt, which is to say the due pass recommendation, or to simply rise and report where we don't uh, make a, you know, the, the committee does not recommend adoption, but simply reports on its activities. And again, leaves it to the council and regular session to take more uh, formal action. Again, it's amend, adopt, or rise and report. Councilmember Scambaluri. And with all of those options, would council members still have an opportunity to offer comment tonight if they wanted? Uh, yes. Okay. That's entirely up to us. In that case, I might recommend and move that we rise and report. Um, we need not necessarily take a vote tonight, but it sounds as if next week will give us opportunity to dive further into this issue as we need to. Is there anyone who objects to us going to council debate? All right, well, we're gonna go straight to debate then without question. Um, I would ask my colleagues to, well, again, according to the motion, we are limited to three minutes each for a final comment and three minutes each for a rebuttal. So with that, I will open the floor to debate. Is there anyone with a final comment on ordinance 2106? Councilmember Flaherty. Sure, thank you. Um, appreciate members of the public uh, sharing views tonight and my council members, uh, colleagues. I uh, definitely appreciate that there are diverse views in the community on this topic um, and respect everyone's good intentions even when we disagree. I do want to note that I think language is important, including the city's policies and what they are, which I believe is criminalizing homelessness. 
According to the National Homelessness Law Center, criminalization of homelessness is when law enforcement threatens or punishes homeless people for doing things in public that every person has to do. This can include activities such as sleeping, resting, sheltering oneself, asking for donations, or simply existing in public spaces. It also includes practices of sweeps or displacing homeless people from outdoor public spaces through harassment, threats, or evictions from living in camps. The National Coalition for the Homeless says the criminalization of homelessness refers to measures that prohibit life-sustaining activities, such as sleeping or camping in public spaces. It goes on, there are multiple types of criminalization measures, which include carrying out sweeps, confiscating personal property, including tents, bedding, paper, clothing, medications, et cetera, in city areas where homeless people live. We also clarified in the meeting tonight that people can indeed be arrested if they don't move when asked by the police, that they are trespassing, and that the threat of arrest is ever present. When asked if they could commit to not arresting an unhoused person sleeping in public space who is otherwise behaving lawfully, the administration declined to do so. But the central question posed tonight is if an unhoused person is unable to go to a shelter, where are they legally allowed to sleep? We clarified that the current answer is nowhere. The gist of the administration's response was that this is not a central function or obligation of government. And I think this is where we very strongly disagree. I believe the government does have an obligation to secure the basic rights, dignity, and security of all residents, including our unhoused residents. As the sponsors have noted, this is not a cure-all or a long-term fix. It is a matter of protecting rights and reducing harm to our unhoused neighbors. The administration mentioned a lack of expertise several times, which again is why I think it's so important to defer to the experts and people with lived experience of homelessness as the sponsors have done in developing this ordinance. It's very easy to criticize this and say this isn't the right approach while offering no alternative at all, and we've seen that tonight. But I'm sorry, that's simply not good enough. Our current policies criminalize homelessness and violate our residents' rights and dignity. This ordinance is a way to stop doing that. One can bring an alternative approach or bring an amendment to this ordinance, but continuing to criminalize homelessness is not acceptable. That's my comment for the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Further comment? I saw Councilmember Smith. Mr. Thank you. you have three Th minutes. Th thank you. Um, I've spent 40 years in social services in my life. Uh, a good portion of it has been in direct service, working with, with people directly. I still do that. I work at Area 10, trying to help people. So sometimes um, the choices we have to make about how we approach problems just diverge and we don't exactly agree. I think we have to recognize that it's morally unacceptable to let our neighbors sleep in the cold when we have the resources to help them. And I, and I think we're going along that path now. We're getting people together and organizations together and developing places for people to stay uh, in a dry, um, environment with warm, warmth and some food and a place to use the restroom. I think we need to come together instead of being, you know, kind of being at odds with each other. Let's come together and move forward on this. Um, I, as well as my other colleagues on the council, have heard from a lot of people in the community, and it has been. Um, overwhelmingly opposed to the ordinance. And people really do care about the homeless in this community. They just don't think that having camping in the parks is, is the solution. So let's, uh, let's pull together and try to get a better solution. Uh, I don't, it seems like uh, camping in the park is just not really a solution at all. Let's find some places for people to be and be able to have treatment and make it a, make it a better world and a better community. Uh, the impact on the public, people are very, very concerned and have written us, uh, all of our council members, myself, the mayor, everybody, they're very concerned about the impact on the community and whether that's totally legitimate or if it's just their fear, um, I don't know. Um, so I, I'm really concerned about that the ordinance really misses the point. 
Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Varallo, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, I think that was a very well spoken statement by Council Member um, Smith. Uh, I wanted to note that I, I think it's quite unfortunate tonight that there is a lot of disparagement and mischaracterization of staff made, um, which isn't helpful. I think that they have been on the front line of working in a very difficult situation, uh, committed significant resources. Uh, personal resources, and uh, I, I admire them for the work that they've done. And I also want to mention that I think what the deputy mayor was saying, as I understand it, and he's told me the same, is that it, he was describing what I think appropriately is, uh, this is a community problem. It's not just simply a city problem of opening up a number of parks and and this will uh, you know, solve the situation. Well, not that anyone thinks that, but this is, I think the impression that, you know, is, was, was made is that, uh, you know, he's, he's, he doesn't care about the situation, he cares about a great deal and he's working very diligently to try to resolve it. And I think that the fact that we have uh, committed significant resources of the city uh, to agencies uh, and, and help them, uh, with regard to this pro problem is, uh, you know, bears it out. Um, I, I wanted to say that uh, I, I certainly uh, appreciate the sentiment of the, of the sponsors uh, in working what is on a first take, I think it appears to be um, to fill a need, to fill a gap, uh, as was said, in working toward uh, providing uh, homeless people with a place to stay. Uh, in this case, though, I think among other things, it codifies, of course, opening a number of city parks for encampments. And if it therefore uh, imposes a, a responsibility uh, of care and, and, and liability concern for the city as well for those individuals, uh, for those encampments in perpetuity. Um, this isn't a trivial matter. I mean, this is very serious and it places a burden on a number of departments. So they've expressed concerns uh, about the time, the resources, the expense. Clearly, there's, there's a large disparity in the approximation of, of what this is likely to entail. I tend to think that it's going to require a large commitment. Uh, we don't know what that commitment is in terms of, 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 of resources. Um, they've, they've expressed concerns about having the needed skills to be able to implement this. Um, and there are implications that they don't know about, that they, they've admitted to, and they're still growing. And so it's understandable that they uh, are concerned about the pace of this legislation. And I agree with that. Um, it's relatively easy for us to change code and then leave it to staff to cope with it. And I think that that is a real concern of mine. Um, so finding that the number in the seminary park was kind of interesting for me of the people that were in, uh, camping there uh, never exceeded 14. It seems to me that at this point that we need to focus on work and resources where it's best applied. And that is, as Councilmember Smith was saying, the facilities needed to house people, uh, to provide them shelter. And this, this ordinance doesn't do that. Um, and so for those reasons, I, I, I will probably, I'm not going to support this, um, but I'm open to learning more in the next week before we have our final debate and our uh, deliberation uh, take action. So I'll conclude there, thanks. Thank you. Uh, further first round comment. Don't all raise your hands at once. Councilmember Piedmont Smith, three minutes. Yes, I want to thank everybody who um, has spoken tonight from the public and all of the uh, people who reached out to us uh, via email as well. Um, I disagree with Councilmember Smith. I do not think that it was overwhelmingly against the ordinance. Uh, uh, if we count um, the public comment tonight and the emails, um, I think uh, it's um, probably more. Uh, in favor of the ordinance. Um, we do, uh, uh, I, as a co-sponsor of the legislation, 
I do not claim that this is a solution to the homelessness issue. Um, I agree this is a first step and um, it is not an ideal step. It is not ideal for anybody to be uh, camping outside in this weather. However, people are doing it and people will do it regardless because there will always be people who cannot go to a homeless shelter either because there's no bed available, because they are um, no longer allowed there, or because of um, mental health issues that just prevent them from, from feeling safe there, or even um, uh, identity issues that prevent them from feeling safe there, or past experiences. There are lots of good reasons why people cannot go to shelters. And so they will continue to sleep outside. And it is inhumane to say that sleeping is unlawful. And that's basically what we're doing because there is no lawful place for them to sleep currently. Um, you know, I, I uh, would love to hear other solutions. What are the alternatives? You know, the, this problem has been with the community for 40 years and uh, we have not uh, addressed it. You know, we've, we've affordable housing, yes, thank you to the mayor and his administration for um, the affordable housing that has been created in the last five years, it's, it's been excellent. I acknowledge and appreciate that. But the immediate problem of people uh, who um, are in extreme need and struggling just to survive day to day and sleeping outside has not been addressed. That, that has just gotten worse due to the pandemic um, and the, the economic impacts of the pandemic and the fears that people have to go to shelters due to the pandemic. And, and so it's, it's really come to a head and, and I welcome if there is another way to um, make these, uh, to, to acknowledge the rights of these individuals and, and give them uh, the security of at least not being illegal, then let me hear it. I would like to hear it. Um, I have not heard a better, a better way. And I think that this is uh, a step one, a stopgap measure while we diligently work on longer term solutions. Thank you. Further first round comment from colleagues who have yet to speak. Councilmember Sandberg, you'll have three minutes. I appreciated what Dan Cohn said early in the public comment about this being a very hard policy choice. And it is, and it is our responsibility as council members when looking at the needs for the entire community and the resources that are required to run a city in all of its parts. My biggest concern at this point, and, and a reason for why I will likely be opposing this, is the lack of due respect that was paid to our city staff who will be tasked for executing this plan. And I think a lot of their statements have been mischaracterized. I appreciate the public who came here to speak today, but I sift the information that I hear and I listen to it from all over, not just members who attend these meetings, but also the public that do contact us as individuals. And uh, there have been quite a few who, who have actually said they don't want to come into these meetings because they don't want to be blamed and shamed and ridiculed and mocked for having concerns about what allowing our public parks to be ceded to this kind of activity when we've actually heard from our city staff that they don't feel they have the skill set in order to manage it for us to think this is good policy. I frankly think it's flawed on many levels, not the least of which is the fiscal impact that has not been successfully studied and presented to us. And that's one of our biggest responsibilities up here is the fiscal impact of anything. What that we currently do on behalf of the citizens of Bloomington, are we willing to do without if this is going to end up being a major responsibility that the city has not taken on in the past? And we've heard very loud and clear from our staff that this is not something they feel comfortable having the management responsibility for. This belongs elsewhere in terms of people who do have that skill set and that expertise. I will also have to say I do not uh, go along with the characterization that we're criminalizing homelessness. 
when the city indeed does contribute as partners and collaborators with a variety of social service agencies in this community to do our level best to support. Uh, I have a question about uh, federal funding and what, if anything, has city staff done with regard to that and why the city of Bloomington perhaps was not awarded funding to be able to help in these gap situations where we don't have the transitional housing in order to support what we're seeing as symptoms developing on our streets and in our city parks that looks like failure. And it is failure. There is no question about it that there is a problem here. No one that has contacted me that opposes this policy because it's flawed um, would, it would, it would say that they are happy about the fact that there are individuals having to sleep on our streets. Um, that's all for now. We have a lot of work to do before this can be palatable to me. Thank you. Anyone else who's not yet spoken first round? Councilmember Scambaluri, three minutes. Thank you. Um, one broad statement and then two more specific ones that may be helpful as we frame next week's conversation. Um, it was interesting to me that that someone, two people, both of whom supported this ordinance tonight, made two very different observations. One said that the, the number of speakers tonight in favor was 70 something and the number opposed was in single digits. I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, and another speaker who also supported this ordinance reminded us that we need to think about the people who aren't here. Um, therein lies the nuance and the challenge of, of the decisions we need to make up here. Um, we do need to listen to voices that are here and voices that are not here. Um, two more specific points I wanna make. Um, there is ambiguity in language here that I am struggling with still. Um, the, quest, the fundamental question I ask as I read this is, all right, what, what exactly will this obligate the city to do? And how are we gonna manage that? How are we gonna staff that? Um, we have talked about the need to collaborate with. We've talked about defining what is acceptable amounts of space or appropriate amounts of space. Um, I'm concerned about the obligations that will create for our city and what that means. And it's difficult for me to support an ordinance if I don't understand that. Um, finally, one other speaker commented on the council member who also who always says there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Um, that would be me for those of you, who, I mean, for those of you who haven't heard me say that before. Um, I'll admit that I've only been on council for about 14 months now, but nothing that has happened in the last 14 months has changed my mind about that. Um, particularly on complex nuanced issues like this, there are no solutions, there are trade-offs. And that's what we have to do, we have to navigate those. And so particularly with that in mind, I look forward to hearing more about financial impact next week. Um, even the most basic reading uh, of this ordinance leads me to ask questions about what kind of staffing is going to be needed, what kind of oversight is needed, how much is storage space going to cost, how much are storage materials, is there additional PPE that we're going to need for our staff, um, how much staff time will be taken. Um, I, I have concluded for myself that there are resources there that haven't been reflected in our discussion that we're going to have to come up with. And that means those are resources that are gonna, that can't be spent on something else. So I think we need, we have an obligation to understand what trade-offs we're making here. Um, so again, I appreciate the discussion tonight. I am grateful every day that I live in a city that is willing to wrestle with these difficult issues. Uh, and I look forward to next week's conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Rosenbarger, three minutes. Hi, thanks. I really appreciate the discussion tonight, all the comments. I think it was really useful just to hear other perspectives and um, I was gonna say get other ideas, but honestly, I think we're still searching for other ideas if this doesn't work. My comments are scattered. So um, I think most of them are questions, some statements. I think it is important to remind ourselves that people experiencing homelessness are part of everyone who gets to enjoy our public parks 
or in public spaces. This ordinance essentially allows people to use parks for 24 hours a day instead of 16 hours a day. So it does extend time a little bit, but it's it's nothing absurd, I would say. There were some. You're, you're muted, Councilor Rosenbarger. Sorry, I didn't know that at all. I just thought yeah. I hit the button. Okay. So I'm going to just, I can do two minutes. That's fine. So most of, okay. So what I was saying was I appreciate everyone who made comments tonight. And um, it's really good to hear different perspectives from all sides. <sighs> I was gonna say it's good to hear different ideas, but I think what we heard really was just a no to this with nothing else proposed. I hope some folks can come with other ideas, um, but with like the extensive amount of meetings I've been in as of yet, there isn't anything else. Mostly what I have are questions, I guess a, a few comments. Um, people experiencing homelessness are part of everyone who gets to use our public parks. I, I think there is a narrative that makes it sound like if you don't have a home, you don't get to play here. But I uh, think that is incredibly incorrect. Um, basically, I think this ordinance allows people to use parks for 24 hours a day instead of 16 hours a day. And so I, I think it's not out of the realm of possibility to just extend those hours for most of the day to all of the day. There was some discussion in the beginning about the city potentially not being able to buy property. Um, that is a little wild to me because I think the city buys or attempts to buy property for different uses all the time. A few came to mind pretty quickly. Uh, the hospital site, the property that we bought for the convention center that is on hold, and then uh, the attempt to buy the Juan Sells building for the parking garage. I think the city was up for paying a pretty penny for that one. Um, so I think when we want to buy property, we do buy property. Um, so I also think when we want to spend money, we spend money, right? I mean, why why do we say it's okay to have a public golf course if if not providing a space for people to sleep is not a a government problem? It's a community problem, and I'm yet to really understand what that means. How is providing a golf course not a community problem like isn't that something we could just like pitch to the community and then not pay for on our own i i don't really understand that um <clears throat> you know there's a lot of talk about a regional approach which i think is also a great idea um, that's your time i think that is a long-term solution that's it my okay thank yeah. you i think i'm the last one to speak so let me see if i can do this in three minutes um, the phrase uh, that we'd be criminalizing homelessness or criminalizing sleep, and there's been some critique of the use of the word criminalize. I think from a technical perspective, if, if people are interpreting that word to mean that it's somehow felonious or you know, due to prison time, I can understand why they might uh, bristle at that. Uh, so maybe technically it's not criminalizing sleep, but we have heard tonight that we've made sleeping anywhere illegal and a cause for arrest, and that's enough to create grief. Uh, the deputy mayor said that the community needs to have a conversation. This is it. This is that conversation. Tonight is the beginning of that long needed, hard conversation. The people of Bloomington have collectively been kicking the can down the road for decades, for as long as I've been here. Uh, Ms. Kopik eloquently pointed out how hard times are for everyone. Uh, and perhaps it took the pandemic to force the issue, but whoever likes it or not, several of my colleagues have forced the issue and we must reckon with it. This is otherwise a willful blindness to turn away from this question now that it is on the agenda. Um, Councilmember Smith uh, spoke of the residents of District 3. Council Barallo spoke primarily of his concerns for staff. The residents of District 3, their concerns are significant. The concerns of staff should and frankly do concern us all the time. Um, but I don't hear my colleagues who oppose this legislation speaking of the concerns of people who have no place to sleep. They simply stick to the concerns of people that they can better relate to somehow. 
Um, they express concern about city staff being criticized heavily. Uh, I don't know, I don't blame staff for not wanting to come into political theater such as we uh, engage in here, but uh, they're not immune to criticism. And certainly city leadership, not just the mayor, but we council members should not live under the delusion that we should be immune from criticism either. Um, I am sympathetic to some of the legal concerns brought up by members of the public and Ms. Guthrie. I think there might be fixes that would address many of the fears expressed tonight about unintended consequences, but that's not gonna happen in a meeting where we assume we're gonna decide that night. Yet Councilman Barala was quick to state that next week will be our final debate. What happened to taking extra time to think about it? If, they, if we really wanted to come up with a solution, why are we willing to take six weeks to debate committees and eight weeks to debate fiscal impact statements, but we're not willing to go more than two weeks with a problem that we know we've been putting off for ages? Those who are opposing this are not advancing an affirmative alternative to the open statement that it is illegal to sleep unhoused in the city limits, even though we know there are inadequate shelter beds available. If we have more work to do, why would we decide this as quickly as next week? Those are my thoughts. Are there any rebuttal statements? Final call for rebuttal statements. I will entertain a motion. Movie rising report. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any debate on the motion to rise and report? Uh, Mr. Lucas, is that motion even debatable? I believe so. And, and just to clarify uh, for uh, council members, the uh, a motion to uh, uh, to consider a due pass recommendation would not obligate any member to to vote. I've, I've seen the, uh, the council, uh, all council members or, or the vast majority vote uh, abstain uh, if they're not ready to make a recommendation. So um, uh, just wanted to mention that. But yes, I, I think this is debatable. Nevertheless, the motion is on the table. It is debatable. Is there any debate on the motion to rise and report? Final call. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll on the motion. Council member Rosenbarger. Yes. Skimbalary. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Smith. Sandberg. Mr. Smith. Clarify what clarify what the the motion is. The motion is to rise and report. No decision is being made. We're simply deciding to uh, report to the council that we thought about it. Yes. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Sandberg. Yes. Rollo. Yes. And Volin. Yes. Thank you. I didn't hear what the total vote was. Is that eight zero? Yes. Yes, eight zero. All right. Um, we are. Uh, we've concluded our business for the evening. Let me just uh, reiterate: the council is going to report uh, back to itself uh, next week uh, at second reading. This will be taken up again. Uh, it may be voted on as early as next week. Um, uh, but. Uh, with that, uh, are there any other closing comments before we adjourn? Councilmember Scambaluri. Perhaps just a reminder about the state of the city tomorrow? Yes, the state of the city address is tomorrow, I believe at 7 p.m. and it will be virtual. Um, and if there's anyone who would like to, uh, Mr. Lucas, is there a pointer? Is it on the city website where people can see where to link? Yes, the, the <clears throat> link should be posted on the city website on the calendar. Um, in, in multiple locations. Very good. I encourage everyone to attend. I want to thank everyone's attendance tonight. I appreciate uh, everyone's presence, staff, council members, and the public. Uh, we will see you tomorrow at the State of the City and next week at regular session on March the 3rd. With that, I uh, uh, will adjourn this meeting. Good night.